Oh man, Chad, I think you turned the music off. I, I did. I can do that. As a well, no, no, no. It just. Uh, I, I think when you make a note, it's it's really dumb. Like it's designed really poorly. Like if you if anyone says anything, it just shuts off automatically. <laughs> it's like oh, I thought I was just. I thought I was still muted and such. I don't know. Listen, I'm just a messenger. I don't know how it works. I didn't design it either. Well, whatever it is, it sucks. Yeah, it does. When's Elon going to fix this app? Chad, Cav, GM, GM. Chad, Chad. What's up, brother? Nothing much. I've been quite ill the last couple of days, so my voice and nose is all fucked. So I'll try to keep mute as much as I can. Okay. Sound a bit congested. I'm a little sniffly too, but I think it's just like allergies. I don't know. Yeah, guys. Um, what we got going on here this week? We released the Q1 ecosystem report yesterday. Uh, definitely check that out. That's like the that's probably the. I, I think we're gonna start doing like a quarterly article like that. I think that's just like the the best cadence to put out new uh, new updates and things like that. And uh, Eric was um, Eric Voorhees was putting around that um, some of the stats uh, all around Twitter yesterday, it, like see like a, a ton of people going and, and commenting and seeing like our high level stats. And it's pretty cool to see just how much growth there's been, especially just in the, in the first quarter. It, it, it's kind of hard to, to think about like how much growth this protocol has had, but uh, looking at some of the high level stats, like it, it's pretty clear, um, you know, what, what direction things are growing in. So you guys want to roll through some of these top level stats uh, real quick, and we can just review some of the uh, some of the highest level. Yeah, one of the funny things from from Eric's tweet that I saw from the uh, general channel in the Discord <clears throat> was this dude was just saying like, "Hey, I can trade ETH to Bitcoin with this other exchange, this other Dex," and, and they were like, "Hey, man." Thorchain powers that one. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. No, it's not. No, <laughs> it's not. And we're just like, yeah, dude, it is. It's like, well, my trade actually happened through a sex. So I'm like, okay, well, then what the hell is the point of this entire thread then? Because <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. That's a. We all, we all know you can trade through sexes. If that's not really anything, you know, interesting or new. That's a sign of what's to come. Just everyone trading with Thorchain without even realizing it. Yeah, I this saw that. It was um someone was talking about Rocketx Exchange and like been in talks to them for a while. They're actually integrating uh, Rango's API into their their platform, and um I, I don't know too much like I don't know like too much like granular details about about like Rocketx itself, but uh yeah it, it was just. It, that, that is really interesting when people are like, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> I, I did it on, on this other exchange, but, yeah, it's just powered by Thorchain. So, like, yeah, obviously, Rango uses uses Thorchain on, on their back end, so Rocketx, uh, I, I don't believe they're they're actually live with Thorchain yet, so they, they might be, like, I don't know if they have a different solution. Like, I, I'm not really too familiar with it, but I know that they are in the process of, of integrating Thorchain. We're, we're helping them out uh, along that, so... I, like hopefully that should be done in the next like month or so, along with some other um, some other integrations like uh, like Unizen, like some of the ones that are are public that people are kind of talking about because they're really near the finish line. So yeah, Rocketx is another one of those exchanges that's going to be powering native Bitcoin swaps through Thorchain, and they don't even know, <laughs> and they don't need to know. It's great. This is the way. This is the way. If someone get requesting to come up on stage, uh, let's see what's up. Uh, Darius. What's up, man? Did you have a, a question or something?
All right, well, I'll give you a minute to collect your thoughts. I'll, I'll keep it rolling here with some of the high level stats. Uh, Hello? Yeah, dude. Hey, oh, there you go. Darius, what's up? Hi, guys. Uh, quite impressed with the project. Uh, quick question on the end product. Uh, in the case of a system uh, malfunction of a, or a critical fault, what will happen to the uh, Bitcoin in that uh, end product? Would it be released? Would it, would it be accessible, accessible or locked in? That's a very general question. I, I didn't need more specifics about the scenario that you're talking about to be able to answer it. Uh, meaning, if I if I put the Bitcoin into this uh, end product, uh, is there any any scenario where it could become locked in forever, or what would be the ways to get back to get back access to it? You're asking a question. If I'm, I'm just make sure I want to understand your, understand your question. You're asking that in the scenario where you add you know Bitcoin into savers or something like this, is there any scenario in which you couldn't get it back? Correct. Is that your question? Yes. Uh, I would say yes, that that's probably true with every system on the planet. I don't know what there's no planet, there's no system that exists that doesn't have that. Do you know what I mean? Like, there, there could be hypothetically some sort of exploit. You could lose your private keys, or you know, there's, there's probably, you know, a dozen things I can think of off the top of my head that's probably true with every financial instrument on the planet. I think a simple way of putting it is, is yes, you're still relying on ThorChain to be working properly and to, you know, everything needs to be going along as it is for, for you to be able to, to rely on that, right? Like, yes, there are catastrophic, rare, highly unlikely scenarios where like, yeah, if ThorChain ceases to exist, then that definitely affects savers. So your Bitcoin isn't just like completely sitting there. It's, it's controlled by, by the protocol and using liquidity and, and such. Understood. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool, man. Uh, yeah, if anyone just has like random questions, you can always just request to, to come up. So yeah, thanks for uh, coming up and, and speaking for a minute. Let me get you off the stage. All right. Yeah, let's run through some of the top level um, stats real quick, because I think a lot of these are pretty interesting to call out. Uh, like first being the total volume of of the network from this is so this is in the entire first quarter. So, uh, you know, January 1st to March 31st. And one point two billion dollars of total total volume and the high, highest daily volume being around 37 million so uh pr pretty incredible with with volume honestly um total liquidity so dual side liquidity uh from 93 million to 122 million about a 30 percent increase in um like top level liquidity dual side liquidity and uh Savers position, Savers vaults went from about 9 million to about 26 million or 183% increase in just steady Savers deposits from January 1st to, um, to today. Obviously, these are in US dollar terms. You, you could you could measure all these in, in like nominal terms, like you could measure them in Rune or Bitcoin or whatever, but standardized to US dollar just to make things uh, uh, it's a little bit more more simple to comprehend, especially when you talk about different assets and things like that. So that's why it kind of defaults to the dollar terms. But um, all, there's there's some great dashboards that are uh, that are linked in in the article. It's pinned to the top here, and it was just tweeted out. It's the ThorChain Q1 ecosystem report. Uh, so that's just what we're running through real quick. Uh, liquidity fees collected. So this is like the total amount of liquidity fees for uh, all the swaps. It's about. Uh, one one point nine million dollars is just just shy of uh, of two million uh, collected for I believe that's that's collected total which goes to both nodes and liquidity providers so uh, and so the the entire breakdown of LP earnings is about thirty it's, it's close to thirty percent uh, from earned just from these organic trading fees and then about 70 percent from from block rewards and obviously we've seen we've seen uh some really high volume days where uh liquidity fees have completely flipped block rewards and that, that's obviously the direction that we're trying to go up and to the right with liquidity fees in, in terms of like flipping the the regular block rewards that are coming out of the reserve and also providing revenue towards lps uh, top swap routes. Um, some interesting stuff here. And I, some of this, I feel like, is kind of a function of the top integrations. So, uh, I, uh, yeah, let me let me just go through them first. Then we can kind of put some of these into context. So, first being uh, the, the Bitcoin and Rune swap route. Uh, 
So that's about 194 million uh, US dollar volume going through there. Ethereum in Rune, about 188 million. And then BUSD, 134 million. And then fourth, you, you see a, a non Rune pair. Uh, for the first time, and it's Bitcoin to Ethereum. So that's obviously one of the most popular swap routes, especially on something like like Trust Wallet, which I think definitely contributes a lot towards that. And then also we have BUSD and, and Bitcoin, which is the deepest stable coin pool and and Bitcoin doing about 50 million in USD volume over the, over the first quarter. So those are the top five swap routes. And again, like I, I think some of that is biased toward, oh, definitely arbitrage because... Uh, a lot of these are, are rune pairs. So um, like when, when ARBs are, are going there, they're normally going like Bitcoin to uh, to, to rune in, in synths, obviously, rather than uh, like doing a straight Bitcoin to Ethereum swap. But you can really see the impact of, of something like a, like a trust wallet uh, in there with, with a pretty very high volume from like a Bitcoin to Ethereum swap route, which I thought was pretty interesting. And uh, moving down the line, uh, the top five interfaces. So um, it's pretty clear like that there's like five interfaces which just drive the most volume and liquidity fees and just total number of swaps to, to ThorChain. And uh, they go as follows. So first, uh, Trust Wallet did about 40 million in, in swaps. And that's also with Trust Wallet iOS only being released in mid, uh, mid-February mid or so. So about 40 million in, in total volume going through Trust Wallet swaps. About thirty three thousand swaps, and and th- those and attributed to those swaps is about uh, five hundred about five hundred thousand in uh, liquidity fees. So fees given towards uh, node operators, liquidity providers, just generating yield. So yeah, about about half a million in total fees just from just from like one trust wallet integration, just to get people a really good idea of just. The scale of how big these integrations are and just how much they move the needle. And then second, we see uh, ThorSwap doing greater in the U.S. the total U.S. dollar volume. Uh, so 54, about 54 million in, in total volume going through ThorSwap in about 13,000 trades. So trust wallet, you see about 33,000 trades and ThorSwap only 13,000 trades and still greater U.S. volume. So uh, there's a much higher average swap size on ThorSwap and about uh, 280,000 U.S. dollars contributed uh, liquidity fees through that. Uh, third, we see Shapeshift with about $6 million in volume with about 1,400 swaps and about 70,000 in fees. Uh, fourth, Thor Wallet with about five and a half million in total swap volume with about three and a half thousand swaps and about 50,000 in fees. Then lastly, uh, XD5 wallet with about, uh, with a little less than 3 million in total swap volume with uh, about 800 total swaps and about 35,000 in liquidity fees. And also on top of that, so obviously those liquidity fees, those are collected by uh, liquidity providers and uh, and node operators, just the the stakeholders in the network, but the uh, the affiliates, as in the, the front ends, who can add on, who can optionally add on an affiliate fee to any transaction, they collected um, just shy of two hundred thousand dollars, about one hundred eighty eight thousand uh, over the first quarter, just from affiliate fees. Obviously, Trust Wallet doesn't doesn't charge any affiliate fees. So that's that's pretty much all attributed to. ThorSwap, Shapeshift, ThorWallet, XDeFi, and just, you know, in, in whatever proportion uh, that is. But we really we see really nice really nice revenue being driven towards uh, towards the front ends, which really deliver the, the product of, of ThorChain. And uh, obviously, that's that's really nice for the bottom line in, in terms of, like, who's actually... Uh, in, in, in terms of incentivizing the the interfaces that are that are really delivering the product, so like o- overall, like I'm I'm super happy looking at these stats. And a shout out to uh, uh, to Polaris from Nine Realms for for putting these together. There's a there's a link to the dashboard in the article, so if you want to check out the queries or uh, you know do some of your own analysis, definitely check that out and do so. But yeah, wait, what's your guys' uh, reactions to some of those high level stats?
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they sound great. I I think it'd be really cool. I don't know if you have any of this data offhand or could pull it up, but like to compare quarter over quarter to, to prior quarters, like I'm really curious how that volume compares to like, you know, bull market times. And obviously like it's been growth through the bear, which is like amazing to see. But yeah, I mean, overall, like also good to just cool to see like the 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 changing ranks of of uh partner projects right like with trust coming in and um you know that still has so much meat on the bone too to to increase so yeah i mean great stuff all around yeah with the with this dashboard actually you can just change the dates arbitrarily so uh if, if you go into the dashboard in the article it's just linked on the top of the stats there uh, you can actually change the date parameters. So th by default, it's set from January 1st to March 31st. And we'll keep using, the, uh, we'll, we'll just keep editing this dashboard for like for future quarters reports. Uh, I, I think that, that seems like the best uh, way to go forward. So I, I believe you should be able to just turn it back and look at how, how that looks over a any arbitrary time frame. But you can also use it to look at, you know, uh, like quarter four uh, of last year or something. But it, it's, uh, it, it's very clear that, uh, you know, it, Things are very up and to the right with this, uh, especially with Trust Wallet being like a very, a very big mover in this ecosystem, uh, just producing the most liquidity fees, which is the end goal of pretty much all these integrations is driving liquidity fees towards nodes and liquidity providers. Because that's really how, that, that, that's the way we're going to succeed as a network is driving revenue towards everybody who is participating in the network, obviously. So that, that is like, you know, far and away the number one goal of at least like myself and the, and the nine realms team. I'm, I'm sure like everybody else too is very, very focused on that goal of driving, uh, driving liquidity fees. So I'm really glad to see that this is like, taking shape a little bit and it, it's only one first quarter of this integration bear market like you know things are looking pretty great on on this side yeah i mean it's, from a bear market perspective like <clears throat> going from bull to bear like obviously we're going to see a decline in trade trade volume and lt ltv i'm sorry tvl all that kind of stuff it's like the rest of the industry is just because there's, there's less interest or demand for that kind of those kind of services is because we're in a bear market bear market but at the same time is like because we're having uh higher uh integrations and more trades are happening on a on an organic level relative to um what we saw before right in some sense um like we're performing very well as a dex like like from a fundamentals perspective the other way of looking at it is like from a fundamentals perspective we are we are performing extremely well relative to our like our counterparts like if you were to look at the top 10 DEXs uh, in the industry, trade volume, you know, last quarter versus this quarter, get an estimated average of the decline of how much trade volume has been reduced. That gives you a, a sense of like what the macro, you know, of effect is. And then you can see how you outperform that, that kind of macro on the micro and see how you perform, you know, relative to everybody else in the, in the DEX space. If you wanted to get more technical and, and do all the comparative work. But I, I, I think if you were to do all the work, which I have not, because I don't really care to, but I think if you were to do all that work, you'd probably find that we're doing extremely well relative to everybody else. And Savers allows us, we added, you know, another $30 million, which is, you know, something, what is it, was it 30% or whatever the, the, the quantity is, an increase in, on our TVL trade volume and more than doubled with the um, the uh, uh, um, integrations we've been doing lately. Like all these things that are happening right now and more integrations are obviously in the way as well. So we're doing very well for sure. Um, relative to other people, but not relative to the bull market. Yep. Yeah, I think that's all you can hope for. And then just, uh, again, just like foundations being laid. And then when when the market's here, like the, the infrastructure is so much stronger and it's going to be wild. Uh, Coco, did you have a question or there's something to add on this? Um, yeah, I've got two questions, actually. Um, first thing is... Um, Will I be able, as a rune holder, to um, to take a loan with a new uh, lending and borrowing feature? And the second one is, um, I've noticed that uh, mainstream uh, people, you know, uh, high-profile influencers, nobody even knows that uh, swapping Bitcoin is 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 actually an option through ThorChain. So, why won't we uh, do some marketing or something just to spread the word out? You know, 
I'm not talking about paid chilling for rune to moon, but just spreading the word, you know? Is this an option? Yeah, so the uh, first question was about uh, can you use a rune as collateral for a loan? And the answer to that question is no. And the reason why that is, I know that's very counterintuitive to a lot of people, but the reason why that is is because <clears throat> the goal here, in some sense, is to, is to pull in external capital into the network, right? So if me, uh, Kao, and Thoreau were all kind of like hanging out with each other, we all had dollars in our hands, we just started passing dollars around bet between us all, it's not really, you know, doing much. We're just, you know, we're basically just uh, circle jerking each other in some way, shape, or form. Um, what we want is new exogenous capital, new outside the system to come in, right, to, to cause our little circle to become more valuable. You don't actually get a more valuable circle just by everybody just passing around amongst themselves. You need external capital coming. So if you were to do a room, you know, loan, you would have to swap that room um, into a, you know, derived asset room, which we don't even have that tool for that, but just say we did. Uh, and you'd, you'd, you'd burn whatever rune that is and uh, out of exist out of the circling supply, which that would be positive in terms of the, uh, the effects on the, on the theoretical price. But the amount of, of value that takes to the price is actually relatively small, right? Because right now the cap um, for lending is about, I think, 5 million rune, or, or I guess in technically speaking, it, it will eventually get ex um, extend to 7.5 million. And if you were to remove 7.5 million rune from the circling supply, which right now I think is like 300 or 320 or 320 million or whatever the hell the number is, um, that is very, you know, much not significant in terms of its effect on the price because you're only reducing the supply by, you know, a few, a couple of percentage points. It's not really going to cause room to go to the moon in a manner of speaking. Um, what does cause room to go to the moon is not so much just burning, burning the room, but market buying room out of the market, right? So whenever somebody trades uh, an exogenous asset like Bitcoin, for example, they have to acquire the rune out of the pool. So you buy up, let's just call it $10,000 $10, worth of rune out of the pools, which now an arbitrage bot has to replace the rune that's, that was removed from those pools and put it back into the pools. And now where are they going to get it from? The only reasonable place to get it right now, for the most part, at least the most liquid place to get it, uh, is the uh, Binance Exchange, which you know has the vast majority of external trading of rune outside of ThorChain itself is on, is on Binance. In which case, that order book is only about, you know, last time I looked, I don't know what it is today, but last time I looked, it was about $200,000 in a 2% price change in either direction, right? So if you remove 2% of the circling supply, you can you can theoretically improve the price by 2%, you know, which is what 5% or 7% would more or less is. That's not 2% exactly, but whatever. But if you were to market by 5, uh, five or 7 million room, um out of the out of the, out of the uh, the order books, you're not going to push the price two percent. You're going to push the price far higher than that because only two, only two hundred thousand dollars versus ten million dollars, you know, only two hundred thousand dollars will push the price two uh, percent. Whereas if you buy ten million dollars, it's obviously far more than two hundred thousand. So the reason why we do it the way we do it is because we want to attract exogenous capital. We want the, the, the cap that we have, that's five or seven million cap to be focused on bringing Bitcoin into the market, bringing into our into our ecosystem, into our pools. We want Bitcoin to come in. We want Ethereum to come in. We want these assets to come in because it, pro it provides a much greater value for not just the network, but also root holders. Oh, great. Thank you. And uh, what about my second question about uh, marketing? I mean, it hurts my eyes. I see every now and then some uh, high profile uh, crypto Twitter person uh, doesn't know about wait, where can he exchange a native uh, Bitcoin to other native assets. And I'm like, it's insane. I mean, ThorChain has been around for like two years functioning, you know. So uh, what can we do about it? Well, how I think about it is this. So we've never gone into marketing as a, as a project. We never had a marketing budget. We never hired a marketing person. Uh, we actually experimented very early in, in 2019 about like, you know, do, jumping on, a, on um, I think like a couple of the founders did an Ivan on Tech podcast, but that was like the one time we uh, did, did something like that. And like, um, you know, we just decided it wasn't really quite for us in a lot of ways. 
Um, the way forward, I think, for ThorChain is not to become a household name in a sense, and not to get everybody to be aware of ThorChain in order to choose to swap on ThorSwap specifically. ThorSwap can run their own marketing if they want for their own product. The idea I think that we're that I would like to see us shoot for is to get integrations, and so people like that guy we we're talking about earlier today uh, on, on the on the, um, the space today, who you know swapped via you know Rocket X, and you know he didn't actually swap via Torchain in this particular case, but he might as well could have and would have had no idea that he had swapped on it. I think that's really the way of getting it is tr is just trying to convince the wallets and the dexes and various partners to integrate, and then people start trading on their favorite uh, you know decks like whether it be a rocket x or whatever the hell it might be and they're like hey we're going to trade bitcoin on rocket x i love rocket x and in reality rocket x is not capable of actually trading bitcoin or ethereum so it outsources its need for that that functionality to us that's probably the most effective way of doing it rather than trying to convince everybody to be aware of thorchain and start trading it more directly um yeah okay got it and uh, what about the savers vaults? I mean, uh, how can we scale them? Um, what can be done about that? Like um, $17 million uh, in the Bitcoin pools is, is kind of huge. But um, I think that if people know about it, it could be uh, like, I don't know, uh, 10x. Yeah, if you think about where savers vaults are right now, uh, we don't have a single integration with savers vaults. It's only really ThorChain native. Uh, like, you know, you, you could do it on, on ThorSwap or XC5. There's maybe a couple of very small integrations like Edge Wallet that have a ThorChain Sabres integration, but we don't have one, we don't have a trust wallet for Sabres yet. And obviously that, that's something that we're working on is getting, uh, getting bigger integrations, especially for, for say obviously for swaps and, and for Sabres. So it kind of, it kind of goes both ways in, we, we need to, like be where the users are and have it have this as a service that's offered by by front ends basically you know vetted with their seal of approval saying like hey this is a, a service we can where you can earn on your assets so that that's definitely something that we're thinking on and working on and also just to to like elaborate on the the marketing question a little bit uh it's something that we're we're definitely in thinking about and thinking about experimenting with so uh you know when, when more things come out of that we'll definitely have uh, something to share, but not, nothing to, to share specifically on that front right now. Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. By the way, on Savers, um, if you look at the uh, thorchain.net slash thorfi slash Savers in your browser, uh, in the last 24 hours, we've, we've had an increase of 3.5 3 uh, BDC into the, the BDC Savers, for example. So like, it, it is climbing. It's a, it's a nice slow burn in a sense, very consistent, very slow, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, growing. Um, there's only so much space we actually have on the actual, uh, in the pools themselves. Like we don't have infinite space. This is why we're economically secure, because we don't just allow people to arbitrarily add as much capital as they want. <clears throat> um, I think as, as, as what, what Kyle was saying, as we kind of get more integration partners with like, trust wallet or edge wallet that integrate into this particular feature of savers that'll naturally you know create um, new demand for it of course um but honestly i think even if we didn't do that i think we would probably you know it would probably perform quite well on its own without without well, even without that to be honest i think we already have like the fact that the bitcoin uh, savers is right now is like 80 something percent full is is pretty without any kind of you know uh, integrations or whatever is pretty, pretty impressive. Although I think uh, Shapeshift actually did, did, did integration for this. I'm not sure if they actually launched it yet or not, but I know they're working on it. Yeah, yeah, they, they definitely launched it. But I'm talking about like outside the DoorChain ecosystem, uh, especially ones that have like large, large user bases and and, and like many millions of uh, daily and monthly right. users. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, obviously the Shapeshift has a great as a great integration but like you know any any opportunity that we can have to like move outside of the thorchain ecosystem and just be part of just the, the the global space whether that's like in in wallets or like yield aggregators or or things like that like that, that's the that's the place where um where, where people are going to, to seek yield where it's like right now the people who are depositing the savers they're people who are savvy to what is going on at, at thorchain they obviously have like trust in, in ThorChain security and just like a whole laundry list of things that 
like the average like you know quote unquote average person might not like know or, or understand so uh yeah it's just like it's just a, like it's a matter it's a matter of time too because people in order to you know put your you know put your hard-earned bitcoin into you know something like savers you definitely need trust in the fact that you know thorchain is a like robust and anti-fragile system that isn't gonna you know get hacked or, or go away or you might you might lose your bitcoin right like that that's obviously uh something that only only time can really bring about uh in in trust right or insurance. it's gonna i think it's gonna take a lot of time yes or, or insurance but i i don't think that i don't think there's really been much conversation around like insurance lately I, there i think there has been some like here and there conversations but no like real solid uh service provider and unless you unless you know of one do you know of a yeah i'm working at an insurance insurance company that wants to integrate uh, crypto insurance but we're not decentralized it's a uh, very centralized uh, entity you know yeah i don't is it possible to have a truly decentralized insurance company it seems like there would need there would always need to be some kind of like uh arbitrator in, in the middle maybe nexus i don't know um but we we are looking to uh, integrate uh, the savers pool into our products. Yeah, but that'd be great. Yeah, um, insurance is actually kind of an interesting topic. It's something people talk about, and it, and it makes sense to a certain extent. Um, but it's actually hard to execute on. And we actually went through like um, like a couple of years ago when we paused the chain for a couple months to kind of reevaluate some things. We we investigated the idea of like doing a protocol wide wide insurance. And uh, we talked to uh, you know Nexus and a bunch of other providers, and it just wasn't mathematically feasible. It just it just didn't make any sense. I mean, the individual can do it for like, relatively a smaller you know amount, but uh, but you know doing a protocol wide just didn't seem uh, all that practical. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And also, um, we kind of have better fees than uh, crypto and Web3 uh, uh, companies because we're like uh, 20 years of uh, uh, experience and uh, we've got hedging uh, um, hedging tools that doesn't exist in Web3. So we can offer like quite cheap uh, insurance uh, should we integrate. Um, our name is, by the way, uh, Klepto Insurance. So if you guys want to look it up, um, do it. Yeah, it's awesome. If you want to get in touch, then we can we, we can talk about this later. If you guys are trying to do an, an integration, then I, I would definitely DM uh, Nine Realms or uh, somebody on the team. Cool. Thank you. And we have uh, Mr. Bleck. Hey, Chris. Oops. Not sure if that was just me, but you were a little choppy there. Oh, I think he dropped. But... Yeah, I didn't. I didn't hear much there either. Hopefully, you can come back up and it'll work. Oh, yeah, he might need to uh, to rejoin. Mike, try again. Mike, check. There we go. You got me. I yeah, I, I think so. You sound you sound fine now. What's up, man? Okay, I'm not sure what's wrong with me. It sounds like you're quite delayed, but oh, shit. Uh, yeah, I think we can hear you clear now, but I'll, let me I'm try getting to... the vibe that <laughs> you're a few seconds behind. Yeah, maybe you want to just like uh, leave and then rejoin. Maybe, maybe this time Twitter won't rug you. He's running through uh, 17 different VPNs right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. What, what's the name of that box? It's the it's like the box that no like radio signals can go through, or <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, isolation chamber. You call it oh, there's a there's a name for it. Yeah. Faraday. Faraday. Oh yeah, Faraday yeah, Faraday cage. chamber. <laughs> yeah, Michael Faraday cage. Faraday. 
shout out to Michael Faraday right now. Smart dude. Smart dude. I don't I don't know too much. Uh <clears throat> other than I guess the Faraday cage is named after him. Oh man, he was he was huge in the day. This is the eighteen hundreds in England. He made a lot of very significant discoveries. Uh, Faraday Cage is just, is just one of them. And it's not even one of the more significant ones, to be honest. <clears throat> so what else did he do? Oh, um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think he was uh, is, uh, in the 1800s, in the mid-1800s, if I remember, if I remember correctly. Uh, you did a lot of work around uh, temperature measuring. I remember I see that. The, the Faraday's cage itself was the discovery that you can be inside of a, a cage and the electricity that, that gets hit the cage. Like you have like a lightning bolt hit the cage. Electricity will stay on the outside of it rather than the inside. That's actually what the meaning of it is. Not so much about uh, radio waves and you know that kind of stuff. It's actually about electricity and how electricity passes through metal. And that if you're inside the metal, you won't get electrocuted even. You know, the electricity stays on the outside. You can touch the actual side of the inside of the uh, cage and you will not be electrocuted. That, that's really what that what that particular thing was about. He also came up with the Faraday po- uh, paradox and you know, other things. It took him a long time to get into the Royal Society um, in London. He was very much like kind of because he didn't come from royal blood, blah blah blah, or like prestige. People kind of shat on him, on him a lot, but very brilliant dude. All right, let's uh, let's try the mic check again. Is it uh, working now, Chris? Yeah, it's not working. That's uh, disappointing. Yeah, not hearing you if you're speaking. Disappointing in Twitter, I mean, not disappointing in Chris. <laughs> uh, Oleg. What's up, dude? Hey, guys. Any new? I just had a quick question for Chad. Um, meanwhile, um, I can't recall. I, I feel like I already asked you this question, but uh, it's fuzzy um, in my mind. Um, so with respect to lending, you said the goal was to get like external capital into the ecosystem. I can't recall. Will this um, capital be used by the protocol actively to like in the pools in the sense that say we attract like 10 million more in Ethereum to the Torchain protocol with lending, will that then make the slippage for all the trades touching Ethereum, uh, Ether, like cheaper? Yeah, um, your question is, if we attract more exogenous capital into Thorchain by a lending, will it make the trades cheaper, like trading in general? Yes, for the assets that we can bring on board in the protocol. Um, how do we answer this in a clear way? Um, the answer to this is yes and no. Um, I, I'll, I'll start with the no part, then I'll move on to the yes part. So when you do this, you're actually taking the, the inbound Ethereum and then you're swapping it. You're taking out um, uh, Rune and then, you know, that gets swapped into its, the derived assets so forth and so on. All these things happen. And so that by itself is not actually changing the depth of the pool, which would cause the price to be cheaper, like the pool getting deeper itself. So that by itself doesn't actually accomplish that task. In fact, hypothetically, an arbitrage bot would just take in some rune, put it back in the pool, take out the Ethereum they just they just put in, in a matter of speaking, and, and then carry on. Uh, and so in that sense, the answer would be no. But the reason why I'd say the answer is yes is because the act of an arbitrage bot um, um, going externally to find rune and put it back into the pools inherently causes buy pressure onto the rune asset. And by, by creating inherent buy pressure on the rune asset, you inherently cause you know, an upward motion in terms of its price relative to the amount of rune that was burnt out of the pool. And so if rune price increases, well, that means that the pools in general, not just the Ethereum pool for this particular trade that we're talking about, this particular loan we're talking about, but all of the pools, uh, the room price would be, you know, a higher value, right? So now even the Bitcoin pool, the, the value, the, the dollar value of the room versus the dollar value of the Bitcoin in that particular pool is now off balance. So now an arbitrage bot has to, you know, um, put in more Bitcoin, take out some room for those pools. And so those pools inherently get uh, a, a bit deeper because of it in some sense. And so um, I think that the natural result over, over, 
kind of a, a more kind of convoluted but uh, way is that yes, I think it wouldn't actually cause the room price to increase, which would cause the the depths to get deeper, which cause the prices to come down in terms of swap fees and such. I think it's a natural thing to occur to happen, but I would not also say that that's a guaranteed thing to happen. I almost say like every time somebody has to swap, the you know fees get cheaper. I don't think it's it's that simple. I don't think I don't know, over oversimplify a very complex thing, but generally speaking, I would say yes. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. And just very quickly, let's say we have a successful lending launch. Um, would that then maybe we can expect higher LP fees for the gas assets that will be supported by lending temporarily? Higher gas fees for lending? LP fees, that? sorry. So for the liquidity providers, you said like there's going to be an initial swap for lending and then the arbitrators are going to get the rune elsewhere and then put it back in the pool. So that's going to be just more trading for that pool. So like yep. in the first, say, three to four to six weeks of the lending launch, uh, is it fair to expect maybe slightly higher yield for the liquidity providers in the gas um, asset pools? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to guarantee anything or anything with this, but logically speaking, that's likely to likely, um, just because, um, <clears throat> just because, um, as a, as a dual side LP, you're, you're more exposed to the rune price. And so by a market buying and burning, you know, five or seven and a half million rune, um, out of the pools, the rune price, uh, should naturally increase because of that, because you're just, you're buying lots of external markets. And so because you're over, you're kind of like exposed to the price um, as, a, as a dual side LP, you will have more experience. So the yield will be naturally higher for those people. For savers, they'll be less affected by this because they're they're only exposed to Bitcoin. So if root price goes up, it doesn't really affect them directly all that much. Although increased trading would be a natural result of that as well, just because the pools are getting deeper, not just in the ones you're opening loans on, but all of the pools will be affected by it just because of the, the price shift of the root asset. But um yeah, I think it would. I think it would affect LPs and gain, gain more yield, not only because of more trade volume, because loans are being opened and closed, which causes more trade volume and refreshing of loans, meaning that you you have an open loan, you close it just to reopen it again. That's another thing that would naturally happen, causing more trade volume just organically, but also because of the increased room price would naturally cause the yield to go up for for dual side LPs, but not so much for for savers. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, good question to ask. All right, Chris, let's try this mic check one more time. Still muted. Maybe that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped to listener. You hmm. Try turning it off and on. Yeah, fucking Twitter, man. Fucking Twitter. Did you try changing the logo back and forth? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was up with that? <laughs> like, honestly. Uh, like, three days? Two days? I saw one theory that it was, like, supposed to go up for April Fool's and then, like, just didn't get pushed in time or something. <laughs> I don't know that's if that's valid. Right. But maybe. I thought it was because some sort of lawsuit or something like this about like something. I can't. I didn't really read it because I don't really care that much. But it was some sort of lawsuit that Elon was having, and he's just to, to thumb people in the eye. He he changed the logo to, to Doge Icon. Does anyone want to hear my uh, door chain April Fools idea? Let's hear Definitely. it. What AKA what we should have done next year <laughs> yeah there's there's always next year all right so here, here's the idea all right we we delete the, the developer discord there's no more developer discord instead we we have to we set up uh thorchan.org an anonymous dev image board and we can communicate all on on here just using pictures thorchan <laughs> just <laughs> using mid journey you can only communicate via mid journey I think the name alone is like a 10 out of 10 for me. That's where yeah, all the, the magic the is. Yeah, the name came first. The, the, <laughs> idea, the idea flowed out of that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty right. sick. That'd be kind of, kind of a lot of hilarious. 
Yeah, next year, next year. I, I think it's actually pretty easy to just make your own, like, 4chan fork, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, next year, thorchan.org. I, I'm surprised we don't have a, some sort of tweet on April, on April Fool's, like, you know, we're going centralized, and we're going to remove all the validators, and everything's going to be controlled by uh, by Lena. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> KYC required. KYC required. Must include blood sample. I guess it's probably not a great idea because it'd probably actually affect the market. <laughs> 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 maybe the joke should be a little lighter than that. <laughs> uh, maybe. This is why Chaz not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't be in charge of much, to be honest with you. <laughs> It'll be funny, though. <laughs> Yeah, good idea, Chad. Let, let, let's just say, oh yeah, uh, there's 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 a there's an exploit or something like that. <laughs> just, it's on April Fool's Day. Yeah, good good idea, Chad. I'm just gonna do it next April Fool's. I'm just gonna like put out like 15 tweets in a single day that are like just all the worst things I could possibly say, just to trigger people, just to piss people off and get like get all like the naysayers like, hey, I told you Thor Chain was centralized. Look at this guy tweeting about how whatever. <laughs> just the fucking. Just to be a dick. Yeah, April Fool's is admissible in court, by the way. It's, uh, you know, and that's, a, that's a totally valid legal defense. <laughs> is it really? I didn't know that. Fuck no, dude. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I thought that you were serious. <laughs> I never heard about that. Hey, man, April Fool's is over. That was like, you know, a week ago. You, you, April Fool's me today. <laughs> Oh, let's see. You there, Chris? Oh, so I'm muted, but no words are coming out. I, I hear absolutely nothing. Reach the phone, update the yeah. Twitter app. I have no idea. Chris, sorry, sorry for all the troubles, my friend, but it ain't working very well. That's quite annoying. Anyway, we can move to Discord, maybe? Yeah, I guess we could move to a Discord, but that's kind of impromptu and much of anybody actually show up. But I mean, the reason why I actually wanted to have Chris on today was because he had a really good tweet the other day, um, which maybe we should like link it in the um, thing here somewhere. But um, where he, had, he kind of has this, this idea in, in his head about like the North Star of DeFi and how, like, kind of a series of questions you can ask to understand the, the centralization risk or the risk in general of a particular DeFi protocol. And and the idea that he has, I think, is a good one. I think the questions that he asks are good questions to ask. And um, and I wish we did this more actively with more projects. And that's one of the things I like about Chris and what he does on, on his on his, uh, his show or podcast, whatever you want to call it. Is that he, he get, asks these questions and he likes to kind of give projects a hard time about their implementation and design, which is, I think that's that's very much needed in the industry in general. Um, I, I, and I, I would actually rather, I, I'd like to get more hard questions personally. Like I've done a lot of interviews and podcasts myself over the years, and I'd like to get more difficult or more hard questions than I, than I typically get, just because I, I'm very proud of the design that we've come up with as a, as a, as a community and very proud of how we've implemented things. Not everything is going to be perfect, of course, because you know we can never achieve perfection. But um, I think we've made very good decisions over the years, and I'm quite happy and proud with those, and happy to defend them even against the most urgent, uh, you know, extreme individuals. Uh, but I would love to have a conversation with Chris about this stuff because it's very good series of questions. But I didn't seem like it's going to be happening today, unfortunately. Yeah, hopefully we can figure out another time or place to do it. But but you were on his podcast. But that was a white. That was way back, like yep. over maybe like two years ago or something. But that's still probably a great episode to to go back and people could listen to it and kind of like just learn some of the the inner workings of of the original Thorchain design. But yeah, I, I love Chris's thinking and like you know I guess I guess some people think he's too hard on projects and stuff like that. But I think we need more Chris's to to try to poke holes and. Like you said, like when you get asked the hard questions, that's where like the, the the real shit comes out, and you really have to figure out these like edge scenarios and make these systems as resilient as possible. So, 
um, yeah, I have, I, I really respect and, and, and love to follow Chris. So hopefully we can make it happen. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Maybe we could just go through some of the points a, a little bit. Uh, just so this isn't just a, a total flop, but like I, I pinned the tweet to the top up here so we can, we can talk about this, uh, DeFi North Star metric, basically, uh, which is the different values of a, a DeFi protocol. Obviously, uh, you know something that like Thorchain is very well in, in, entwined with, and something that that we think about, and all the all the contributors think about in uh, like how to make this protocol like truly decentralized and and immutable and <clears throat> a, a core part of of DeFi and just this new open financial network. So uh, the, the, the first the first principle, obviously, being trustless. So situations where trust in the core team is involved, uh, trying to avoid those, uh, including a variety of things like an a, uh, admin key, changeable oracles, off-chain transactions, funds, custody, token governance, oligarchies, uh, balance slashing, uh, et cetera. Yeah, that's actually one of the the biggest problems in the um, in the DeFi, like especially in the Ethereum world, the smart contracting world, is uh, the ability that the, that the devs have to to update the contract because these what it's called a proxy contract. Because as everybody knows, when you deploy a smart contract on Ethereum, it's immutable, and so in order to have code that you can change, you create another contract in front of it that just proxies to another contract. So you deploy a new contract and then you update. The, the proxy contract, the new configuration that points to the new contract you deploy. <clears throat> and so you can do this in a way that allows um, devs to make code changes and such. For the most part, almost everybody uses proxy pro- contracts. I think Uniswap is one of the very few people that, that don't use it, and I commend them for that, although it also comes at a cost of like, well, if there's some sort of bug or exploit, you're pretty, pretty much fucking screwed because there's nothing you can do about it. But um, the problem comes in like how... It, it allows the, the devs to to make code changes, right? Without any kind of governance necessarily, depending upon how the proxy contract is implemented. And we've seen this structure recently with um, with um, what was it called? Uh, not Mango Markets. It was called um, Oasis Oasis Protocol. They they run like a hundred. I think it was one hundred and fifty million dollars worth of assets from one of their LPs, which was the person that attacked uh, Wormhole Exchange about a year and a half or two years, over two years ago, I guess now. And uh, they made a software change. They pushed it out that allowed them to rip out one of their liquidity providers' funds and run them. And that's obviously like, that should you know set alarms off in people's minds in that sense. So like the ability that, that the an admin key has to like force a software update um, is, you know, inherently highly problematic. And we see this very, very commonly in, in the Ethereum DeFi space. It's, we see it almost everywhere. Um, there are ways you can do it that's a little better. Like, for example, you could like update your proxy contract, um, but the effect doesn't the effect doesn't actually take place until like two weeks from now. So at least if you do, if you are forcing an update of your of your software on, upon everybody else, at least that gives people a two week window where they can you know withdraw themselves or or you know uh, withdraw the liquidity or whatever they want to do. It's at least better than nothing. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I like about you know, Thorchain in this case, and because it's a layer one, you know, I, myself or anybody else for that matter has no ability to force software updates onto the onto our own community. Everything has to be adopted through governance, and that's every each each individual validator has to make the choice to update to version, you know, two point whatever the hell it is, um, and one hundred percent of all the validators have to update to that thing in order to adopt that thing. And so that requires, you know, that is governance in a sense. That's, that's every one of our uh, important validators doing their job. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a big component. It's something we see almost every DeFi project. Well, very, very few of them don't pass that, even that simple litmus test. Um, in his comments, I, I'm just curious to ask kind of from his perspective is like, Somebody was saying, why is Thorchain not on your list? He posted like a short list of what he would consider to kind of like pass all these criteria. And he, Chris replied uh, that Thorchain requires trust in the node operators. So I'm curious, like what you think he was getting at there and how you would, like, how would you kind of break that down? Um, I mean, I, I can see where he's coming from, I think at least. Um 
whenever you have a layer one, and it doesn't really matter if it's a proof of work or proof of stake, you have to have trust in the people that run that, the miners or the validators, like they're the ones that are actually doing it in the end, right? And those individuals, whom, whomever they are, always have the ability to, to change the software, right? Underneath you, like you don't, it, as a person who holds room, you don't have the ability to, 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 to freeze the chain from upgrading to a new version or, or, or changing the, the behavior uh, in any, any stretch or form. Um, and that's true within the and within Bitcoin as well. If you hold Bitcoin, you have no control over like what gets adopted, what doesn't get adopted. What gives you power is how much mining power, how much hash rate you have. And 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 he'd be correct to say, and I'm sure if he's on, on here, he would say he'd be correct to say that Bitcoin is, is more decentralized than than uh, than Fortune is. And I think that's recently uh, a fair statement considering the number of miners that exist. The total capacity of uh, of hash rate in the Bitcoin network is probably much more secure than than Thorchain by a good mile, and I would totally agree with him. That's a fair that's a fair statement to be made. Um, in the end, you do have to trust that, that the validators aren't going to make a change that is against your best interest as a holder of the asset. Now, your 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 viewpoints are aligned because obviously validators are holding the, the ruined asset, and you're holding the ruined asset, and so you're your your incentives are pointing in the same direction. Neither one of you want to see room go to zero, and both of you want to see room go to the metaphorical moon. Uh, and so that is that is the concern. But that concern also exists even in proof of, proof of work networks. Because, for example, even your most ardent Bitcoin maxi will tell you to not use time lock contracts, right? The time lock contract is something you can do on Bitcoin where you can say, you know, I'm going to put some Bitcoin into this wallet and I'm going to lock the wallet so it can't move the Bitcoin at all, no matter what, for t 10 years. And in the earlier days of Bitcoin, people were using this as a me methodology to, to like give Bitcoin to their kids or grandkids or something like this and gift it to them in a way that they couldn't move the funds for 10 or 20, 30, arbitrarily, however long you want to set to uh, 10 or 20 years. <clears throat> and so they can you know, sell the Bitcoin too early and, and they get it when they're 25 rather than when they're five or something like this. Uh, and the reason why even Bitcoin matches will see to, to not utilize, utilize that feature is because if if Bitcoin chooses to make a fee, uh, a change that you do not like, or if Bitcoin says we're going to change how time lock works and uh, uh, time lock contracts work, and we're going to say that you know, we add some new restraint on it or something like this, well, no matter what it is, you can't move because because your Bitcoin is being locked in a particular wallet, and so like even like. You're, you're setting yourself, you're locking your capital away, then you can't actually get control of it. Therefore, you're, you're just basically at the behest of the miners to make whatever changes they want to the network without you being able to do anything about it. And that's a bad idea in general, right? To be locked something up for like extended periods of time like that. If you watch it for like a week or two, that's, that's, you know, that's obviously fine. But if you do something for like 10 years, that's obviously much different. So I think he's right when he's saying about like you have to trust the validators of this. And that's true and that's fair. But you also have to trust the, the miners of Bitcoin to, to not make choices against your, your interests as well. Ethereum is a little more uh, complicated because uh, you're not you're running your own kind of system and your own kind of rules that you're kind of managing yourself because you're running your own swear contract. But um, it is an interesting conversation. One I wanted to get into, into the details with, with, with Chris about. Yeah, so uh, like obviously we had that whole remember that conversation with uh, Tobrol back in I want to say November or December where we yep we we kind of argued about trust for probably about like an hour <laughs> just the just the definition of it and how you can say something is is trustless or, or not and like I guess it all kind of comes down to just well I don't I don't, I don't even want to get into it honestly but well uh, the the, yeah. the important thing from that whole conversation was that like in the end there is nothing that is actually trustless. The idea that something, that anything is actually trustless, meaning right. that there's zero, absolute zero trust, is nonsensical. And I don't care if we're talking about Bitcoin or Ethereum or Thorchain or whatever. Like nothing in the world is actually fucking trustless. And so we, we use this term; it's a little bit like you know hyperbolic in some sense, or a little bit misused, but um, uh, an exaggerated term at best. But uh, but nothing in the world is actually trustless. So when he says that you have to trust the validators, he's right. And to say that we also we also have to trust the miners of Bitcoin, that's also right. You could also make a very you know, practical argument that we have to trust the values of Thorchain more than trust the, the miners of Bitcoin. 
And that's true in some sense because the number of people required to make a change for, for ThorChain versus uh, Bitcoin is a very big, very different number. So the amount of trust for Bitcoin is, is far less than it is for, Thor, for a proof of stake network like ThorChain or any proof of stake network for that matter. That's just a natural thing to happen when you have a proof of stake network. But like at the same time, like we can't actually even use, we can't actually use proof of work. Like if you wanted to rebuild ThorChain, get rid of the proof of stake, replace it with proof of work, it's impractical for us to do that because we need instant finality in order to be able to do trades or swaps. If we can just like undo the last five blocks of Thorchain, right, from because of a reward or something like this, well, then now you're insolvent. Now you've just lost a bunch of money. Now people have got trades they shouldn't have. Now people withdraw that they shouldn't be able to withdraw or something of this nature. And like it would become, it would become a, you know, a pretty significant disaster if you ask me. Or if you wanted to, you could say, you know what, we're just going to wait five blocks before we actually do anything. Okay, now you don't have to deal with rewards as much. But now you've made trading and swapping so fucking slow because you have to wait for many a blocks uh, of a hash rate that's probably going to be pretty small in the beginning because hash rates are always small in the beginning. Like, it would just be completely impractical uh, technologically to, 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 to implement something like a Thor chain where you have to like make changes on other changes, uh, uh, make changes on other chains. Completely impractical to do that with proof of work. So you have to do with something with instant finality, which is what proof of stake is. And so like with <coughs> with that <coughs> excuse me, with that comes a different set of uh, requirements. Yeah, for sure. And looking at the other like points of this DeFi North Star, uh, like open source transparent, permissionless, censorship resistant user sovereignty, uh, th those are all things that are I, I think pretty obvious and seeing how they fit into into you know how thorchain operates and the the one that is like the biggest question in people's minds is like the the, the trustlessness like like are can, can you trust thorchain validators and obviously like every effort has been made to make sure that thorchain validators have the the right incentives to uh actually operate the network obviously being that they that it's uh a necessity of thorchain that they're always over collect they're always over collateralizing what it, what they're securing in the vaults to maintain their economic security, which is uh, at the end of the day, the base layer of Thorchain. And actually this kind of ties into that CZ tweet from, from the other day uh, where he was talking about, uh, it was, it was a tweet about uh, Uniswap V3 and uh, yeah, let me, let me see if I can pull this up, but Talking about Uniswap V3 and just ba basically saying, like, you know, with, with these DeFi protocols, it's all about ensuring finality, ensuring that validators uh, will process transactions and, you know, they won't, they won't steal from the network. And Thorchain's design is the only one that always ensures that there is economic security and not a trusted relationship between the, uh, the validators that secure the, the vaults of the native assets, so the, the ones that are actually, you know, have the have the TSS keys to the Bitcoin, then you know to need sixteen out of twenty uh, validators in order to sign out any funds from the network. Uh, so Thor Thorchain is the only one that guarantees that economic security that the validators are always bonding more than they are they're securing. And to, to my knowledge, it's it's the only only cross chain network that has a guarantee about economic security of the funds. Yeah, and that's an important question to ask. We, we talk about trustlessness. What are the incentives at play, right, to, to get people to act in, the, in accordance in the best interest of the network itself, right? And so if you take a Bitcoin, for example, if you had an ability, if you actually had enough hash rate that you could 51% attack Bitcoin, just imagine you had it in your back pocket or whatever, would you actually do it? Or would you just mine Bitcoin and make a bunch of money from the mining of it? Or would you try to double spend and some sort of transaction and, and like, you know, reveal that you have 51% and all this kind of stuff and, and make, probably make Bitcoin go to, you know, drop 90% in value in a matter of a, a couple of days. Or would you just sit there and fucking mine it and, and stuff? And so like the incentive is it, <clears throat> part of the, the trustlessness is like, is like when can somebody act in accordance with the network and when can they act against, in accordance against the network? And where does the incentives actually lie? Does it push them towards the incentives of the network or does it push them towards the thing of stealing or against the network? In the case of like another cross-chain DEX that, you know, that, that's, that um, secures ex heterogeneous capital, all of them are incentivized to go against the network, 
right? Because it's more profitable to go against the network than it is to go with the network. In Bitcoin's case, it's more profitable to be with the network, even if you had 51% attack, it's more profitable to go with the network. And in Thorchain's case, it's more profitable to go with the network than it is to go against it, right? If you actually had uh, enough of the, of the validators of Thorchain to, to be able to, to, to rug some funds or whatever. It always goes along with the network. So it's not so much like we're trusting people and the way thing we trust people to altruistically, you know, um, behave in a certain kind of way we could do in some, some services. Like... Um, you know, the liquid network, for example, the trusted federation or rootstock and these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> it's actually just, it's, it's ensuring that people behave in the correct way because they're financially incentivized to do so, not because we asked them to. Yep, for sure. Uh, let me just go through this conversation real quick because I, I think it's pretty interesting back and forth and one that really only Thorchain has solved this problem of, of economic security. Uh, and just maintaining that validators need to follow the rules because they have, uh, you know, sort of Damocles hanging over their head. So, all right, the exchange goes like this. CZ says, we need more DEXs. Pancake has most of the users. Uni has most of the TBL. And it's still too centralized. I know. Imagine that coming from me. We need more options. And someone, uh, someone says, what about making Binance a hybrid exchange, self-custodial like DEXs, with the performance and liquidity of a centralized, service, centralized venues like Binance? Uh, aside, hmm, I wonder what service could offer something like that? Uh, some some non-custodial version of Binance. Very interesting concept. Anyway, uh, he goes on to say, easier said than done. Have to ensure fund security too. Make sure that the counterparty of the trade gets paid and no one can scam the system, i.e. real ter- real-time settlements. Blockchain throughput is just not there yet. So wh- what do you think about that whole uh, that whole statement and like where, where Thorchain fits into that? Yeah, I mean, he, he's right in some of the things he's saying. Like, for example, like blockchain throughput stuff is not there yet. Like, he's thinking from the mindset of an ex- a centralized exchange where you have like you know, high frequency traders, you know, doing many trades per second or something like this, and which which Binance is like maybe is their bread and butter in some sense. Uh, and he's right in the sense you really can't do high high frequency throughput trading on on a blockchain. You can kind of do it on on Thorchain somewhat if you if you if you stay within synthetics, <clears throat> um, you can still you can do some, some pretty good throughput, but still not nearly to the degree to the quantity that you you can do on a centralized exchange. He's he's right in that sense, <clears throat> in that in that way. I would I would agree with him, but he's also right saying that that's really hard to ensure security as well. That's that's why nobody else has you know accomplished it with the exception of us. Yeah, well said, Chad. Sweet. Um, well, anything else you guys want to talk about today? And anything else that's like uh, on top of mind? Um, not immediately, but people are welcome to hit the request button and come up if they have questions about anything. I see. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, so I'm going to butcher it. But Cfi, Cfi. Steffi. Steffi. Yeah, he's in the crowd. Yeah. I don't know if I he mean. wants to pop in, but it's good to see him in here. Yeah, and Cam's in it too. I'm always a big fan of Cam. He's a smart dude. One of the uh, Delphi guys. Yeah, we got a good yeah. crowd. Yes. Uh, let's get Juggernaut uh, up here first. You got a, a question? What's up, man? Hey. Go, guys. Um, do you hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a short question that uh, tortured me by because uh, as everyone seen, uh, there's a lot of question about if uh, what if a state attack Bitcoin with a with a fifty one uh, attack? Uh, um, do you believe this possible? I, I, I got the market cap there. It's 500,000 million of dollars. Which state will try to, to attack this? Well, we know that miners now are all farms and uh, farms can aggregate. Okay. But do you think that's possible with this market cap? It's for everyone, like the question. 
Uh, is it possible that a state could 51% attack Bitcoin? I think mean, that's basically your question. Um, I know it's a hard thing to say. <laughs> I think the biggest problem, to be honest with you, like, take a country like the United States, who has obviously gobs of money, in a sense, and will print it to however they want it to. But um, uh, part of the problem is actually not just the monetary requirements of, of actually buying enough hardware to be able to do this. Is also being able to acquire the hardware itself. Like it, it takes it took ten plus years of of, of mining building uh, companies that they've produced over the last thirteen plus years of you know ant miners and whatnot, different types of miners over the years. Like <clears throat> you, you're basically going to pin all of that hardware across whatever new hardware the United States purchases. It sets up in some rig somewhere in Texas, probably. Um, and that would be very hard to do, right? Like it's, it's not impractical, um, cause it, but it, it would be extremely hard just to be able to acquire enough, like, uh, raw materials to be able to produce enough hardware to be able to, to have enough hash rate to outperform, you know, all of the current hash rate today combined of every piece of mining hardware that has ever been produced, bought, and is being used today. And of course, the old hardware that you know you used like three years ago, nobody uses at all because it's like it's just so weak. So you have to constantly be buying, you know, new hardware to to stay competitive. In which case, you know, I mean, it, it's possible, but it'd be very, very difficult. It'd be more effective to like try to try to convince miners today who are already you know mining Bitcoin and try to pay them off because they already have the hardware readily available and it's already set up and being used and that kind of stuff. It, it would be extremely difficult. I don't. I don't think it'd be all that practical, and it would. It would cost an absorbent amount of time and energy to do so. I don't think. I just don't see it happening. To be honest. Okay. Thank you for your answer. It's um, reassuring. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, man. Yo, Sefi, what's up, dude? Oh, not too much. Uh, hopefully, you guys are having a good day. Just on lunch break a bit. Came in a little late, so. Not sure what all the controversies today are, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know that there's an obvious incentive to uh, attack the Bitcoin network. It's still relatively small in terms of market cap. And, uh, you know, the market cap is maybe it's, it's not even at some of the biggest companies in the world yet. But like, what would be the purpose of doing so? Because if the thing fails, ultimately, for some reason, whatever, quantum computing, you name it, um, then it fails, like, but whose money would be involved with like taking on this attack and like, you're going to bury all that money and throw it away for what exactly? So like, let's say you bought all these miners and somehow took over the network. Now what? What are you going to do with it? Shut it down to protect people, of course. And that's what <laughs> Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren would probably tell you, right? She wants to, you know, launch an attack against Bitcoin to, to sink it to zero so that, yeah but like uh, when you when you listen to her speak like there's very little evidence she understands money at all i think she's an idiot so i, I, yeah, I really I, don't I, think she has any <laughs> clue what she's talking about about anything what, what like, whether it's whether she's an idiot or not or has a clue if she's understanding that is kind of doesn't really matter in the context of yeah is it feasible or or possible or is there would there be interest people can be moronic but still have an interest in doing something right yeah to me it's like it's much more obvious for um the government to spin up a sort of like centralized system with a lot greater ease than it is to mess with the existing, like the mess with the Bitcoin network. Cause they already have the dollar effect. Right. So like all you'd need to do is like uh, put together, let's say a thousand different computers floating around uh, the United States, all centralized, meaning like owned by the government or whatever. Um, it's going to be fairly resistant to DDoS attacks and whatever else. Um, and like you could pretty much, achieve a fairly strong network um if you want to go to like the cbdc route or whatever it is you want to do um now that's that's barring all the obvious like bad reasons to build cbdc's but that's the other problem with a lot of these folks that are building these systems or like their wish list is i think they just really don't have a good imagination for how tyrannical this all can get um when you hear most of the folks speak about this sort of thing um I think it's like they, they're not using their imagination of how it just backfires quite badly upon themselves um, to where like 
the political class, even if you thought you were in control of something, like the system with a CBDC based setup, like is uh, is an optimizer and essentially like moves to controlling you. <laughs> like it's like it, it there's it 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 just always like every sort of like permutation of how you think of this always ends in some catastrophic disaster for human beings in a sense. So and and you know like Bitcoin itself is not perfect in some ways. Like there are problems. So like for it to take over all the world's money or something like that, it's got some obvious issues with privacy. Um, it's got, and those issues with privacy make it concerning for things like, um, you know, corporations and their treasuries and such. It's not like, uh, there hasn't been a simple solution for that. Um, some, like some level of centralization ultimately is necessary for, um, some like KYC able privacy in a sense. And like, it's, it's, uh, there's almost no getting around it. I think mathematically, like nobody's been able to figure out a way to do it so far. I don't know. Maybe Chad, you've had some idea, like, like with Thorchain, you know, you've got, um, you know, the option to exchange between things that provide privacy versus things like Bitcoin that is more just, um, you know, provides that scarcity function, but not necessarily privacy. Like, but what do you guys think about like, you know, what, what does the ecosystem of coins look like? to make the world work on crypto. Have you, have you guys thought about that a bit? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting conversation. I remember I was talking to uh, Zuko, who was the guy behind, he's one of the OG Bitcoiners and he's the guy behind uh, Zcash. And one of the reasons why he decided to <clears throat> like, so fascinating uh, side story, but relating um, that um, Satoshi himself actually talked about, uh, zero dollars proofs before he left about I think it was about three months before he kind of like went, went ghosted and he talked about actually implementing within Bitcoin itself and he actually uh, agreed that it should be done at some point but the problem at the time was that there wasn't that the development of the ZK knowledge proofs was quite primitive and wasn't really practical to implement Bitcoin at that point, point, point in time. Fast forward I think it was about a year and a half later or whatever the number was and um, there was a breakthrough and uh, some professors at MIT can have a breakthrough on, on ZK knowledge and um, they went to the, these professors actually went to the, uh, the Bitcoin conference, I think it was in St. Louis at the time, if I'm not mistaken. And they went like, hey, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's do what Satoshi talked about, you know, a year ago or how it was. And let's, let's put zero, zero knowledge proofs into, into Bitcoin. And the, the devs at the time, the, the conference was small, like there's only like 30 or 40 people at this early on in, in Bitcoin's history at that Bitcoin conference. But the devs basically said, like, no, nah, we're not going to do this. Like, maybe some, you know, altcoins can do it or something like this. Like, somebody else can experiment with it. We're not going to put it into the core protocol of Bitcoin. And, and so then the, the professors actually went to uh, Zuko because Zuko has been around in digital, um, you know, uh, assets since, like, the 1990s. Like, he's been around for fucking ever, like, way before Bitcoin even existed. And they asked him if he'd be willing to do it. And, and Zuko said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Like, he actually literally turned down the, what would eventually become the idea of Zcash. And... It he turned it down the idea, but then he he did a one eighty once he realized to himself that like people are going to want to have their privacy and be able to like you know buy things or get paid from their company or like whatever it is that's being happening to do that privately. If you have to do that in a public ledger, then that's especially because then like just it will not be a non functional uh, unit of exchange, right? It just won't, won't function correctly. That's why he created Zcash. And this is kind of pulling on what you're saying about like Bitcoin's not particularly great at, at privacy. You know, it technically has it. Taproot with snore signatures with, you know, mixing wallets, like that gives you some level of privacy. Uh, you can argue all day about what the level is between the level one and the level 10 and compare it against other systems like Monero or Tornado Cash. But, but the point is that, that like that different systems it will have different values and, and attributes that they put forward. And Bitcoin will probably never become just because I don't see a push for it within the community today, the Bitcoin community, to become a, a privacy first kind of uh, mentality. I think they'll always just be like anonym, anonymity first. And if that's the case, then they will never have you know strong privacy, probably. And by me, I, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not an expert in the future, but uh, it, it's a inevitable thing that, that different uh, assets and different chains and different pieces will just have a different set of attributes that, that, are, that are, very, are very useful in this situation, but not so useful in that situation. And a natural thing to occur is being, is being able to move between these different assets and utilizing the power and functionality of any given asset for the times and the, wind, and the situations and scenarios where it makes sense to use that thing. 
Bitcoin is going to be very, very useful in some scenarios. It's not going to be very useful in other scenarios. So sometimes we're going to need privacy, which is not Bitcoin. Sometimes we want, we want a very strong store of value, which is what Bitcoin is, so forth and so on. Yeah, it's like I've not seen so far a solution that would work for, say, I don't know, my corporation, for example. You know, there's not like, and, and until that solution exists, it's hard to assume that like a lot of corporations are going to care about adopting any one standard for this purpose. So I, I think it's a, it's a mixture of like one, you know, obviously a significant amount of adoption has to happen in order to make it worthwhile to even bother because your customers have to have this thing. And if they have it, they might buy your products. But on the other hand, you have the flip side problem of like um, corporations particularly need things like privacy and um, nobody wants to give away all the secrets to, you know, how much revenue they're making or whatever it is. Um, you know, so like it, the transparency is kind of a double-edged sword in a sense. And uh, uh, the whole point of like having a corporation to some extent is like having a, a group that um, has secrets to, 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 to a large extent and that you can use that alpha or that, that innovation to then like, you know, one up your customer, your other uh, competitors, and um, like really, really open money makes it hard to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, not only, not only just corporate, but like <clears throat> imagine a hypothetical scenario where I'm buying, you know, um, an air fryer on Amazon and I can pay in, in Bitcoin, for example. And, you know, I pay Bitcoin, they ship the air fryer to my house at 157, you know, Oslo Lane, I don't know where the hell it is. And, now they have it in their database on Amazon of what my address is, what my name is, and how much Bitcoin I have in my wallet, which let's just imagine for a second discussion is 1,000 BDC. Now all that data is there on Amazon servers, and what are they going to do with that? Well, that, they could actually sell that. That could be valuable information but for some people. Um, it could be exploited, like some, one of the employees of Amazon or somebody breaks into Amazon, a hacker of some kind, extracts the, the Bitcoin addresses and, and the physical addresses of where people live. Okay, this guy's got 1,000 BDC, this guy's got 500 BDC, and this guy's got this over here. I'm going to go ahead and break into their houses and you know, be, be an asshole. And it, it's just like using um, open ledgers for, for just general commerce doesn't make logical sense to me personally. Using it for store of value, that makes sense. I can get behind that. Yeah, the attack vectors are interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, like this is this is sort of why most of us have delegated to store of value status and are not really that interested in like opening our wallet to go buy a, a Big Mac at McDonald's or whatever. Just like there's no practical reason to do that at this point. Yeah, maybe maybe that'll change in the future. There's the other yeah, there's the other thing of remittances too. Um, you know, there's a reason why Visa, Mastercard, and whatever do what they do. Um, sometimes you know you don't get your air fryer, um, or maybe you get your air fryer and it's broken, and you want your Bitcoin back. Um, you know, there's all sorts of problems with without having a middleman. You wind up with um, problems that uh, a smart contract may not fully be able to solve. Um, such as like you being happy with your air fryer, <laughs> you know? So like, uh, and then there's, uh, other components to that too. It's like the, if you, um, yeah, like just refunds and, and, and all, all of the kind of elements that go into that. Um, it's kind of like yeah, you, why you would need, much. yeah, it's kind of why you have an entire layer for that purpose. Right. Yeah, you would need some legislation that would require businesses to operate with the ability to do refunds and so on, so forth and so on, which I'm not even sure that's even already true today or not. But if I buy an air fryer and I receive it, I buy with some Bitcoin, I receive it, if the whole thing's you know broken to begin with, and I return it, I should get my Bitcoin back, and there should be some sort of law that ensures that. What do you think about the idea that like digital money is more than anything useful for digital goods and services as opposed to necessarily real world ones. Um, we, like there hasn't been a very, very strong push in the so-called like so-called web three space to ultimately turn all of like the digital assets uh, into something you'd pay with pay for with just digital assets and the digital world, maybe when it gets bigger, 
maybe we'll be singing a different tune. Like let's say a hundred years from now, and you know, more of the things we care about are actually digital products, not physical ones. Maybe there's, there's a room for like uh, the crypto economy to be the native economy at that point, but maybe within the country of digital space, you know, as opposed to like trying to convert that to physical goods and services. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. This is actually kind of something that I, it's one of my probably more extreme viewpoints is is that um is that like the the quote unquote metaverse and I personally fucking hate this term to be honest with you, but just the, the digital universe that we that we live in will eventually become its own like its own country no matter speaking, or maybe thousands of countries depending on how it's structured. But like <clears throat> whether we'll have like, you know, citizenship in the United States of America, but also quote unquote citizenship. And I don't mean that in a literal sense of like issued document and that kind of shit. But just like the idea that, that you are a part of um, another sovereign uh, state of some kind that exists purely digitally. That's a kind of the more of extreme idea that may happen, you know, maybe not next year, but maybe in 20 years, 15, 20 years, that might, that might happen. Yeah, we have like pretty strange times coming. Um, <laughs> like just, just, just all the AI tools and revolution that's happening there. Um, I see a lot of those services being potentially paid for digitally um, just because it makes sense. Like if you think about like cognition as a capability that's very, very like digital in this sense, um, you have, let's say you're paying for your little, you know, AI behavioral therapist, right? Like it makes sense to stay within the digital realm for that. Maybe you pay for it with that. And then let's say there's AIs out there that want to hire you for doing shit like in the real world, they're going to pay you with digital money. Um, you know, that, that, could, that becomes really, really interesting. I, I have this theory that like the AI agents may actually reach a point where they're actually larger consumers on this planet than actual humans. That could be really weird. Um, you know, like they're it's competitors crazy. to us as, as actual consumers and that it would make sense that they would want to, they would use digital money. Cause why, why wouldn't, why would they need physical anything except to buy, like make, you know, another, <laughs> to make Chad go and build, you know, another server, um, you know, like it pays you in Bitcoin or something. They definitely would consume more data than we do, right? They can, would consume vast quantities more than we would. What about with like potentially private stable coins? Do you guys feel like that would solve the the real world stuff as far as like your personal privacy and revealing revealing your your balances and such like that? Like if you in the future, and, and this was kind of like where Terra was going for a while, right? It's like if you could, you know, borrow against your Bitcoin and have that converted to a private stable coin that you could then like pay for all your real world day to day stuff with. Like, what would be the reservation for that? I if think, you could just I think stay people's fully biggest go. problem is going to be their paranoia about who actually is the arbiter of two, truth and who ultimately um, do they KYC with. You know, I mean, like at the end of the day, it's like I know people like to blast government for everything, but you have a democracy or representative government or um, uh, for a reason, it's so that you at least have some semblance of human beings being able to sort of control their own destiny. Nobody's arguing that any government's perfect or doesn't have centralization or tyranny issues or whatever. That's, you know, those kind of things are obvious. Um, but you, like, let's say, for example, like, you know, a, we all become more trusting of um, AI agents as an example. And we're like, hey, you know what? Like governments can't be trusted. People can't be trusted. Let's trust this thing over here. It's going to control my CBDC. And it's going to decide like, it's going to contain the information, like my privacy information, whatever. And that way, if like the, the, the police, you know, the FBI or whoever wants to sort of figure out where my money went or what I used it for, then it would ask, they would ask the AI, show them the credentials and whatever. You could do all that, but then what ends up happening is, is like you wind up with um, a, a backlash of people that are going to say, wait a minute, like this thing's not human. We need to go back to humans controlling this. And who's the default situation that can do that is ultimately the government because you know corporations are going to be like quasi ai services too at some point so it's like it's a weird thing that like you ultimately end up with a governance problem and no matter how you go about this you wind up back at square one to some extent like the founders of the you know 
constitutional founders all like, you know, worried about these exact same things. And this is hundreds of years ago. Um, and you all, you always wind up with the same exact circular, circular logic. Um, it's almost like it's cyclical. You just, you can decentralize things to some extent, but then like you, people tend to want that, um, you know, some sort of human representation at some level. And then once you do that, you, you have to trust somebody. Right. So that it's an interesting pro process, but like, to me, it's like, if, if I'm going to own a CBDC type of object, um, or like, a I don't know, a stable coin generally, in general, it's got to be like fully decentralized or to me, it's got to be fully government. There's not a lot of in-between to me. Like, like wh why would you add one more layer of, or vector risk in between, right? Like or owning circle, um, USDC, how, do, how does that help me exactly? You see the problem? Like, either, like either all your, like to me, it's like either I have a, um, a crypto that's fully decent sufficiently decentralized enough or I have a US dollar. Um, or maybe I have gold or some other store of value, but like, there's not a lot of in-betweens where I want a CBDC. I mean, I'm sorry, a, uh, a privately owned stable coin, which somehow reduces the risks, you know, like it's reducing what risk you're adding corporate risk and all sorts of other stuff in between. Um, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's good for holding, yeah. but it could be good as like a temporary medium of exchange, right? Like if you, if you're fully crypto native and you're like, just like that example of taking a loan against your Bitcoin or something, using that for commerce and then like the business accepts that and oh, quickly yeah. converts it to whatever, to whatever they're comfortable holding. I'm with you completely. It's kind of, I, I, I want to use yeah. it. I, I totally want to be able to use a staple coin. I get it. Um, I think it's, the deeper question is like, how big are you going to allow that to get before you yourself are going to be worried? Hey, wait a minute. Like the circle court, let's say the circle corporation a hundred years from now, like, let's just say, for example, is, you know, dealing with like 30% of the people's money or something. I'm just make up some number. Um, how big is too big to fail or too big, like too big where it's like, wait, what kind of nefarious um, things could this company possibly do to our lives? You know, like you see the problems. So it's like, there's no, and then you could have like millions of stable coins, right? Like you have lots of different ones, but then that's a different set of problems without a certain scale. You don't get safety either. So it's like a, yeah. <laughs> like, and then the, the one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin folks essentially say, well, if it became all the world's money, right, you wouldn't be having this discussion because everything be denominated in that. That's the end of it. And that's a possible future, I suppose. But, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But in between, it's like people like their stables, right? Like, and we like DeFi to have stables in it because like, it's really tough otherwise. But it always goes back to this trust problem. I mean, look what happened with uh, like Circles DPEG. Like shit, like, you know, that wrecked a lot of DeFi holders somewhere, right? Like there's got to be people in protocols that lost money as a result of that DPEG. Yeah, I think some DeFi protocols even um, hard-coded USDC to be $1 uh, in, in the actual code base, which was terrible, terrible, terrible idea. I actually like to drop some kind of crazy uh, conspiracy theory alpha at, at people here. But I think inevitably the the best stable coin out there is going to be Bitcoin, just because stability of an asset, generally speaking, is is very much correlated to the to the market cap of that asset. And the, the larger the market cap, the more stable the asset just naturally tends to be, because it takes a lot more economic pressure to to change the price either up or down. <clears throat> and so, like I think, like once Bitcoin's market cap is, and I think eventually it'll get there to be like you know a hundred trillion something like this which would, which would be bigger than, than the u.s dollar at that point or just to get, the higher it gets it becomes inherently more and more stable and then, and then at that point like at some point bitcoin will likely become more stable as an asset than the dollar is i think if if you agree with me that, that the market cap of bitcoin will, will continue to increase and one day surpass the market cap of the u.s dollar and if anybody out there who believes that the u.s dollar is going to zero which there are some people who believe that then you probably agree with me on this I'm sure you do. But like, I think that's probably the, the inevitable result. We think about stable coins now because Bitcoin is relatively speaking very volatile. But I don't think that's going to be true in like 15 years or 20 years. And anyway. Bitcoin will become the, actual, the stable coin itself rather than something else trying to be, be stable. Chad, when you go to like uh, Bitcoin meetings or whatever, um, it, how much talk has been there, has been out there as far as like changing the hashing algorithm at some point? Like the, the actual compression, the, the actual compression, um, I'm sorry, like the, uh, the actual cryptographic mechanism. Um, 
the reason I say that's because like if we need we're waiting for like BTC to become like a you know a certain size uh, and assuming we have like a trajectory that doesn't flatten out and really continues to grow let's assume we're talking about like 15 20 years time frame um, the doubling time of like qubits on quantum computers I think you know Ivy Mosbury sitting around 400 plus the doubling time is increasing and the error correction technology is increasing quite quickly. So in that yeah. doubling time, you could get to the 10 million plus qubits maybe. And then that's not including even like various AI elements in creating some of the circuitry and everything. Like it's interesting how aggressively optimizing those systems are. So let's assume like we had a compute, quantum computing platforms that, um, you know, can actually, uh, affect Bitcoin in, let's say, 15 years to make up a number. Um, yeah. Have there been some like moves to sort of like preempt any of this with various quantum resistant uh, algorithms? Because that has, that has a big role in the hardware too, obviously, because the hardware of the network would have to be optimized, not just the software. So, yeah. Um, I mean, that's been talked on and off within the Bitcoin community for, for quite a few many years. I remember listening to a few conversations throughout many years. Um, right now, my general feeling sense that I get from people when I talk to people, I mean, this is just my own subjective um, understanding and uh, objective reality, but is that for most people, like, they don't really consider quantum computers to be a, a much of a risk to Bitcoin. Theoretically, mathematically, it is in the long term, but nobody sees that risk quite yet. Now, the idea is like, how are we going to change things in 15, 20 years when quantum computers become uh, cheaper to manufacture and get packed? You know, you, you mentioned error, um, error, error uh, codes and that kind of shit that happens. Uh, and they also like being able to not have to cool uh, quantum computers to be like near zero fucking temperature, a Kelvin, near zero Kelvin to, to function and offer. Like, there's a bunch of technological things that need to be kind of broken through. And arguably, some of these things aren't even possible to be broken. But we never know until we actually try. Sorry, my earbud just died. Um, it is possible to do so, and and I can even go into the mathematics of like how the hashing actually functions and works, and how the difficult difficulty is calculated. Like all these things, we can get into the nitty gritty if you really want to. Um, but it just comes down to like in the end, it comes down to search space, right? Because in the, and like in a sense, like what Bitcoin mining is actually doing, it's it's doing like a, a mathematical game of of hide and go seek. Right, we've we've hidden some sort of nonce or some number that represents the answer to this problem, and people have to, have to just start digging randomly and finding places. And so, quantum computers just allows you to dig a lot more fast and a lot more different places simultaneously. Um, Silicon-based computers they really operate in a, in a linear way typically, uh, although that's not entirely true. But um, quantum computers allow you to just do things uh, simultaneously, and so it allows you to search a much larger area in a much shorter period of time to be able to, to find things much more efficiently. And so what you can theoretically what you can do is just by making the area larger. And how we calculate that area right now is based on the hash, right? The, the difficulty of, of Bitcoin is not as, as represented as a hash, which is about 64 characters of a, of a hexadecimal uh, representation. And so the, the max size of difficulty is relative to that natural number. Right, what, with how large the, hex, the hash number can you actually get, which is actually quite large, mind you, but still not large enough that quantum computers can't, you know, fuck around with. So we'd have to change the search area. And I'm, again, I'm not an expert on quantum computing or, or, you know, Bitcoin hashing necessarily either. But you'd have to change the hash to be instead of being a 64 character hash to be something uh, larger. It doesn't have to be necessarily significantly larger because with every character you add, you're exponentially increasing the search area. It's not just like a linear relationship, it's an exponential relationship. So if you were to increase from 64 characters to 128 characters, theoretically, you wouldn't be doubling the amount of space that you could be searching. You'd be like, you know, multiplying it by, I don't even know what number it would be. It'd be like 85,000 duo dectillion quadrillion fucking something crazy. Really, really. Right. Just cra crazy. Uh, There's some mathematical number that our, that our people, <laughs> right. human brains couldn't function with. But even introducing it, just one additional character would, would create, you know, an, an exponential uh, effect to the search space, even a single character. So that's one way of doing it. People argue that that, that methodology... Perspective, 
And the reason why they might say this is because uh, if you get to a situation where quantum computers are now mining Bitcoin and, along with silicon computers, then you get in a situation where every silicon computer is so effectively slow, right, in terms of its ability to, to process, it becomes very, very, a very quote unquote slow miner, right? I, I think the miner. worry about quantum, though, is not to the, the um, ability to mine Bitcoin, but to reverse engineer uh, an address. And so essentially, like, be able to yeah. devolve, a, you know, uh, the private key, essentially. But... Yes, but that's another thing. You're absolutely right about that. I thought you were referring just about the hashing. Yeah, I, mean, I, um, I would think if you were going to develop a quantum-based sort of, like, um, cryptography, you could just basically start a whole new network uh, at that point. That's a different yeah. thing. But I was just talking about, like, just the, the safety of your private key based on, you know, where the, uh, like, the, the, the level of brute force attack that are that a quantum system might be able to do in 15 years and 15 years goes by quite quickly. I, I might add, like, I remember when, uh, you know, like if you were there when like some of the earliest, like, I don't know, monitors were created and look at the 8k thing, you can buy it like your Sam's club now for like 3000 bucks. It's obnoxious how, how much, um, you know, like where tech goes in such a short time. And if you look at like right now, look at GPT and all the other drama behind it. Um, I think a lot of people did not predict 2023 would be, we would have the level of capability of GPT-4 and things like that. So there's a sort of acceleration happening, um, even with quantum, like uh, so many of the um, um, defense industry and um, pe you know big players like IBM, Google, et cetera. So many significant, like large companies are doing research there. So there are like job openings out the wazoo, by the way, in case anyone's interested. <laughs> so like the thing is like, there is a kind of takeoff of that happening um, in terms of people learning it and people developing on it. And so I, I think sometimes the, um, the speed with which these things can arise may not, may be faster than you think. And the, the corrections to, you know, BTC or any other system may not be, as quick as we want and, and like people you know bring up the y2k thing remember chad remember y2k like <laughs> like oh like you know the systems are going to crash and all hell's going to break loose and blah 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 right um but a lot was done over like a period of um five to seven years to correct for y2k related problems um and therefore like when the event actually happened it became a non-event um so there are there are some examples of where like you know you preempted a catastrophe but i'm just wondering if how far the Bitcoin community has gotten in thinking about it. It's, it's, yeah. it's not a good idea to bury your head in the sand is what I'm saying. Y2K was a, was a kind of a funny one because in that instance, the reason why people were so f fearful is because the, the year was always represented in a lot of code to be two numbers, you know, like 98, 99, and then like 2000 were represent the year 1900, not the year 2000, which would cause banks and how they measure interest rates and blah, blah, blah to go all haywire because it's now 1900, not the year 2000. In hindsight, we were a little over, you know, over extremely concerned about that. It was not like a, even that hard of a problem, just like change that from a 42 digit year to a 40. There were some year. fun t shirts and, though, right? There was definitely like a lot of people <laughs> panicking for sure. And people were like, literally waited for like midnight and then make sure the lights were still on. Like they were literally afraid up to the second that the lights would turn off. Uh, but even with the idea of like breaking somebody's key, right, with an, a quantum computer, it's actually the same thing as what I was saying about the hashing because the a private key is actually, for Bitcoin, is actually also 64 bits length, right? We have different ways of representing that private key, that 64 bits. We could do it through, you know, a, a, a bit, I think it's called BIP39, if I hopefully get the number right. I think it's BIP39, where you can have those words, you know, like uh, trampoline and fox and, you know, forest or whatever the hell the words are. I think it's 2,063 words in the BIP39 um, specification. And that's just a way of just describing that 64 bits. And so if you wanted to break up somebody's, private key to, to brute force it with a quantum computer, you'd have to find their, their, their public key and figure out how much Bitcoin they had. And they have a lot of Bitcoin in there. You want to take it from them. And you just start iterating through every permutation of those 64 characters, uh, which is, I think is represented in alphanumeric um, letters and numbers and non uh, case sensitive. 
and you just iterate through those until you find one that works, right? One that, that actually generates a wallet with actual funds in it. Like, but if you were to do this today, uh, any of you, if you had a really fast computer and you were doing a trillion guesses per second, right? If you're doing like a, a one or two trillion guesses per second, you still would not find a wallet with actual money in it before the sun would encompass the earth and just suck yeah. it. Yeah. Because at one point... I, I think the, the will... estimated number of qubits is something like mm, 10 million qubits. And we're at a few hundred qubit computer. So it's definitely not anywhere near anything like that now. It's just that looking at yeah. the doubling time of qubits on... Uh, with major systems, the doubling time seems to be quite substantial each year. That's the, that's what my thought is. Like, it's not so much. Certainly not now. There's no, there's no way right now for that to make any impact at all. Right. It's completely impractical today. But maybe quantum computers will make, one day make that different. And then all you have to do effectively is add a, a 65th character. Right. Get rid of your old wallet. Get a new wallet with 65 characters instead of 64 characters. Right, and now you've just like exponentially increased the difficulty on the quantum computer to guess what your private key is, and so you can easily scale this up, you know, as high as you want to go. It doesn't really matter today whether you have twelve words or twenty-four words in, in your in your mnemonic phrase. There, for all intents and purposes, they are the same security. Mathematically, they are obviously not the same security; they're not even close to each other from a mathematical perspective. But they're both extremely fucking high that. You can't discern the difference from any normal practical, practical perspective. Yep, but I, but I do think like, um, but the, only, the reason I brought all this up is just like the, the long term view. It's like for countries and large companies and all to adopt. You know, there's these, there are these sort of like uh, lingering concerns people are going to have, right? It's like um, if if something happened to sort of like the Fed's computer or whatever the presumption would be they just manufacture more money, right? Like, it's as simple as that. Like, <laughs> and uh, that's the end of it. Like, but, but with, when you have a trustless uh, decentralized system, the, that trustlessness needs to be absolute and, uh, you, and you don't have to worry about this sort of thing. And I think, you know, at some scale, countries probably would worry about this sort of thing. Um, at, at not, you know, countries generally, um, if they're going to be moving, let's say into Bitcoin as their, uh, you know, let's say their primary currency, the so-called Bitcoinization. Um, these would not be things that aren't talked about. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, there is a lingering concern that, that, that these, these systems could accelerate a lot quicker than one thinks. And you have all your nat nation's money in there. Uh, now what, right? It's kind of, it gets interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think your Y2K analogy is a good one just because it was a lot of fear and concern people freaking out for something that's easily fixable. So it's not even like, to me, I don't, I don't, to my knowledge, and I'm, again, I'm not a quantum computer, computing expert or anything like this, but to make things difficult enough for a quantum, to be quantum computer resistant is not the most difficult thing in the world to crack. It's actually quite quite simple. So I, I think it's very Y2K and that people can freak out now because theoretically could, the whole world could come down. But like in reality, we'll fix it, we'll move on, whatever. Uh, hi, sorry to interrupt. I just want to have a quick question for Dorje. I have like 10 more minutes and I know um, I don't you know, mean to interrupt your conversation. I just want to get a, a, qu a question in really quick for in regards to Dorje. Go for Shoot. it, man. Shoot. Okay, cool. Uh, it, it's in regards to the lending system. Still trying to wrap my head around the lending system chat. Um, you know, maybe like in a few minutes, could you just uh, maybe break it down? So let's say... I, I have a thousand uh, rune and uh, um, um, I'm, I'm trying to borrow against it. Where does the, the let's say I, I borrow, I, I mean, can I borrow USDC or USDT against it? Uh, if so, how much and where does like um, the funds come from? Cause, like, don't you have to like to sell the, uh, the rune to USDT or, or where does it come from? That's really my main question to avoid any like dilemma in the, in the reg, in the regular, um, lending systems. Yeah. So, um, a couple of things, uh, one is the, the network will not allow you to use rune as collateral in a loan. You have to use some sort of exogenous capital, probably at launch time, it'll just be Bitcoin and Ethereum. And those are the only two assets that'll be allowed, uh, on day one, we can have discussions and arguments about expanding to other assets later, but that's the first thing. 
Second thing is most of the time in, in, in DeFi lending, th there's there's a market that's created by some sort of protocol. And then there's somebody who provides, who's somebody who is the lender, like some person walks up to become a lender and somebody who is the borrower from that lender. And they kind of get matched through some sort of protocol between the two of them, which would be a compound or an Aave or something like this. Thor chain is structured a little bit differently than those. Um, not a little bit, actually a lot different from those. And, and so instead of the um, somebody providing you the the the, the debt that you receive, some person in the market, it's the protocol itself, right? So then the question becomes, well, where does the protocol get that money, right? And effectively, it just, it takes the collateral that you, that you take, that you, that you gave it to produce it. So you might give the network, you know, $10,000 with a BDC, and the network might give you um, $3,000 in debt. And so it takes that $10,000 of the BDC, it, you know, it takes some small part of that 3000 bit of it and then effectively acquires um you know whatever asset that you want to receive on the other side it could be ethereum or usdc or something else it's more complicated than what i'm, I'm kind of explaining this moment than, than just that than just that but because you're always per the collateral you're providing is always you know orders of magnitude more valuable than the, than the debt that you're receiving then it, it, it the, there's always value there to be to be lent back to you as your debt does that make sense Want to call out? We just brought up uh, Zuko, absolute OG of OGs in the Bitcoin space. Obviously, founder of uh, of Zcash, I believe. And hey, welcome, man! Oh, really hi good to hear from you. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me. I guess I'm late. <laughs> How's it going, Zuko? You you don't haven't talked in a while. I haven't talked in a while. No, no, no. I mean, you and I haven't talked in a while. You and I oh, haven't yeah. had a conversation in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed to meet up in Colorado at some point. Fell through. Yeah, unfortunately, true. Yeah, I, I was looking forward to it. Just couldn't get it to to get the timing to work out. I guess I was actually just talking about you on the stage, just you know, half hour ago, or it was, and I was telling people your your kind of your Zcash story of how you you know came to to to, to create Sorry, it and found you, it. Uh, did you hear me or no? I, I oh, now. I, 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 I what I was going to ask is, um, what is the essentially the design difference between a Thor chain and Aave, for example? Why why can't Aave and all the other lending uh, DeFi um, uh, lending protocols implement the same system um, without? I mean, without getting liquidated. Where's the the differentiation? What makes the Thor chain lending system so different than all the other ones? I know you can get liquidated, but what's what's the design difference there? Um, this is kind of a, a bigger conversation. Um, I'll try to see if I can keep it yeah. short and simple. But... Yeah, maybe, maybe we should just get into this another time. There's already a bunch of resources about about ThorFi, so like in it, like we've already been on for almost two hours. We just got to go up here, so let's just give it just a, a little bit more, and then we could we can go about in about lending like next week or, or so. Yeah, and check out the YouTube video. Ch Chad B did a, a YouTube video that went pretty deep on it, so that might be. Okay, I'll do that. Place. Is it on uh, Chad's channel or, or Thorchain's channel? Look at the article that's pinned to the top here, and there's a couple resources about uh, about lending, and you, there, there's a bunch of links. There's probably about three to five really good videos on lending, people asking questions, and you can get a deep dive. All right. Sweet. Thank you. No worries. How are you, Zuko? What's going on in your uh, world? Uh, I'm good. Uh, life is good. Uh, for For those who don't know, I should explain that I'm – you said I'm the founder of Zcash, and I'm definitely one of the founders of Zcash, but there's a lot of others too. Um, and now I'm the CEO of something called the Electric Coin Company, which is one of the organizations that supports and improves Zcash. But Zcash is quite decentralized, and there's a lot of other organizations that are totally outside of me and of the Electric Coin Company. Just so you all know, that's my context. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're right. Uh, sorry, I I used I should have said co-founder and I said founder. That's that's my bad. Oh, no problem. So cool. So, uh, Chad, where are you? Groups. I posted a a link in the Twitter thread where Satoshi was trying to figure out how to use zero knowledge proofs to fix the privacy leak in Bitcoin. 
And he said something like, if we could figure out how to do this, it would make a much better and more usable version of Bitcoin. But at the yeah, this... time, they couldn't, the, the technology wasn't advanced enough. Yeah, we were just discussing this earlier. Uh, me and Sifi uh, or Sifi, I can never trust the name. Sefi. So apologies, but Sefi, sorry. Me and Sefi were discussing this earlier about the the practicality purpose uh, problems of like having an open ledger to, to just make simple purchases can, can become problematic by nature. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced that the Bitcoin architecture is like fundamentally flawed based on information theory, because if, if it leaks private user information, it's, difficult or probably impossible to fix that leak sort of on top of it. Like once, once your private data has, has been leaked to your enemy, then it doesn't matter whatever else you do to try to compensate for that. Your enemy still got you. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I think that's a reasonable um, thought, right? Like uh, I'm not really a Bitcoin maxi by any stretch as anybody would probably guess of me, but um it makes sense to me that you that you having the ability or choice to be able to to maintain your privacy, even if it's not like super secure privacy, like anti government level privacy, but privacy enough in, on a personal or, or corporate level, that's still to me very valuable. Yeah, yeah. Everyone needs it for almost everything. Some people just don't realize yet that they need it for what they're doing. Privacy is normal. Yeah, privacy is normal. That's that's a good rallying cry especially in our modern era where some some like mega corporations and governments are trying to sort of rewrite history to say like oh privacy is this weird thing that it would be really uh scary and uh dangerous if we had it and i'm like no wait <laughs> that's totally not the way the world has ever worked um uh, what what i'm oh, sorry go ahead ken yeah, I just, I just wanted to add like a, a color on, on the conversation as well. I wanted to share um, like a quote that I really liked on this, um, on private money. Um, this is from Alan's, uh, I, I, I can't pronounce his, his last name, but Alan's In Defense of Private Money. I think it's a, like a mind-blowingly good um, article um, that really elegantly explains like why money laundering is a red herring. Um, he basically says like money laundering is effectively like presenting a sum of money as having like a mundane origin. Um, and if you think about it, really, that's pretty much every transaction. Like the reason why $1 equals $1, like dollar is basically like fungible or at least we treat it that way is that we don't care about its history, right? Like we just, it's like a bearer asset. If you hold it, it's yours uh, and that's it. And otherwise, if you really think about like um, um, the the other way, uh, which means like if the history of um, um, ch like the chain of ownership of an asset is important or should be tracked, like you can't really do econ like economic activities on it because every time you receive an asset, now you have to validate yourself that all of the chain of history, like ownership, is effectively like valid. It's not corrupted or anything. Um, so it like leads into this like um, logic that you're you're always proving proven like um, basically guilty un until you prove like yourself in innocent. Like you have to do all of that work every time you transact so it's just like not doable at all um and that's so it's so absurd that people like don't realize that so i just wanted to like uh yeah mention that yeah reducing friction of transactions is really critical for a prosperous economy and you need privacy like the, the traceability adds friction to transactions i would agree with you on that can you post a link to that article you mentioned by alan someone yeah, it's Alan from. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll do it. He's uh, he works in Nipton Cash at the moment, but uh, uh, his, his like last name is very hard to pronounce. So sorry for that. But I will um, I will retweet, retweet that. So if you go to my profile, you'll probably see it now. Okay. Yeah. 
or any, pretty much anyone interested. Yeah. yeah, I found it on the website asz.inc, asz.inc, and it is on this blog somewhere. Just search in defense of private money and Allen, and it's there. <laughs> I swear you'll find it. But uh, thanks for calling that out, uh, Khan. I'm definitely going to check that article out. By, by the way, Zuko, like um, within the ThorChain community, we've, we've discussed many times about the idea of like adding a coins like Monero and Zcash and uh, yeah. thing, things of the like. And I'm still very personally, I'm still very bullish on on, on getting those done. I would yeah. love to see to see Zcash added. And, and I was Monero wondering what happened because I know that Eric Voorhees and a ThorChain Treasury and the Zcash uh, Treasury, which is a separate independent thing that I have nothing to do with, um, collectively put in funds to make like to integrate zcash into thorchain and that was more than a year ago it never happened and i never quite understood it was technical and or political reasons that has slowed it down yeah from my memory and i could be um out of latest sync on these things but like there were there's some bitcoin libraries that we utilize in order to, to to support the utxo chains which some of these libraries are not forked by the zcash community in, in written quite yet and oh. as, as, i think that was the initial problem I mean, nothing like it's not insurmountable but mm-hmm. then there was also political issues too where um, for some people in the community they're they're afraid that thorchain itself is not yet decentralized enough or to be to be resilient against you know government attacks of some kind hmm. and so they don't they don't want to poke the bear by adding a monero adding a zcash Hmm. poke the the government bear and say hey you should pay attention to thorchain and you should start you know trying to yeah. regulate it or shut it down or whatever they were just kind of fearful that of like you know poking that 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 political bear you know before we have more nodes that are that are bare yeah. metal at least or something like this it would p- potentially useful data point is that coinbase and gemini and kraken lift zcash in the united states and in other countries yeah very good point solid point yeah, I actually don't think it's uh, well. Maybe that could be arguably different because those those ones are are are, um, are KYC'd, and therefore it's more difficult for some malicious entity to, you know, like um, whether well, was a name, what's the name of that North Korean group, um, Lazarus Group or something Lazarus. like this. Yeah, that's it. Lazarus Group to, to to transact, whereas in a third chain, you know, doesn't really um, KYC or you know block addresses or anything like this, and so. Um, a Lazarus group could use it, but I also also argue that I don't think that would be happen just because, uh, just because um, um, Tornado Cash got s- censored by not even by the government per se, just by a specific entity, but like um, because they you know siphoned through six billion dollars plus worth of worth of uh, ether throughout throughout the, the the larger pool on on Tornado Cash. For us, it would be different because I, I doubt that the Monero or the Zcash pools would have enough liquidity enough depth in them to be able to push through a $6 billion like that would just be the pools would have to be incredibly deep in order to support, you know, trades of that size <clears throat> through, through its own pool. So it wouldn't be a practical use for, you know, huge volumes of, of Zcash or huge volumes of Monero to be quote unquote yeah. cleansed through. Uh, there's no evidence that Lazarus group has used Zcash for anything yet. Although I do use Zcash to buy my coffee for like $3 and 25 cents a day. <laughs> well you're you're part of the problem Zoku. that's you buy your copies is, is so can you tell me what what changes in the world of zcash would accelerate thorchain integrating with zcash well i'll tell you this so um one of the thorchain de- devs has has kind of um run off into a, a dark corner and has been working on uh, a Monero uh, integration uh, for the last couple of months or so. Mm-hmm. And one of the ideas that, the, that that is being tossed around that makes people feel more comfortable is creating a new ThorChain, you know, chain, a fork, if you want to call it that, called, mm-hmm. you know, with the temporary name we're giving is, is ThorChain Black. And okay. in ThorChain Black, it'd be, it would probably just be, in my opinion, it would just be, you know, a new Rune asset, Rune Black, whatever the hell that is. And then there'd be a Thorchain pool with Rune versus Rune, Rune versus Rune Black. And then there'd be a Monero Rune pool, Rune Black pool. And then there'd be a Zcash and Rune Black pool. And so this separate entity, this separate blockchain, a separate, you know, protocol would do mm-hmm. all the privacy related things. 
so that in the event that the government gets all spicy about some shit and gets, you know, gets their ass in a tiffy, that we can just, you know what, we can shut down the black part and then the rest of the, the beast keeps on going on, right, without, without putting the rest of the, of the Thor chain network at risk. That's huh. one of the arguments or one of the discussions that's been going on. Personally, I'd rather just see this thing, Zcash and Monero be integrated with ThorChain right now. That's just my two cents. I would love to just forget about the whole black thing and just go direct. But there's you know arguments and debates internally whether that using a separate network for this huh. is, is the way to do it. Are those arguments and debates informed by like <laughs> lawyers? Nope, not at all. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you know, the things I've publicly heard are pretty pretty general you know like the government hates privacy which is uh so so general of a statement that it's not actually true or false right um there's a lot of ways in which privacy is required by law in the united states and europe and so forth you know so like it gets really really nuanced and maybe you guys should talk to a lawyer and get some actual expert advice on it yeah, I think the general community is, and, and, and to some extent myself as well, is basing our decisions are, uh, on on just kind of like hearsay information to, to, for the most part, and people just right. kind of get the, their feeling sense of it, and that can obviously push uh, a governance or a DAO or what do you want to call it in a certain direction, just based on you know false or fake fake information, and not just having the, the bits. I know, I know Chris was just raising his hand. Hopefully, his his mic is working this time. Because earlier he was having some problems. Sorry there. about earlier. I'm on. Starbucks Wi-Fi now, so it's much better. Um, no, I was just wondering, um, w- with regard to Zcash and ThorChain, and your concern about a government crackdown, like what would that government crackdown look like, and why wouldn't it have? Why wouldn't you have the same problem with every other cryptocurrency if if uh, Coinbase, etc., are okay with using Zcash unshielded? It seems like it's kind of apples and apples. And, and what are you worried about as far as a crackdown, like crackdown on node operators? Well, I'm personally not really worried about it at all, personally. Uh, but the, you know, I'll speak for the, the community, or, or maybe Kyle or Thoreau wants to speak for the community and, and have, give their, their voice a uh, perspective. But I think the, generally the concern is that it either just make uh, running a validator illegal or something like this, um, or... Um, it would just cause attention and scrutiny and uh, discussions and become a target of some uh, legal attempt or, you know, people are actually told me that I should be concerned. Like I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to jail personally, you know, this kind of thing, which I'm not really terribly concerned about, but like people are just concerned that it's just going to, um, that fortune is not decentralized enough to withstand a government um, shutdown or attack of some kind. I don't know. I'm not concerned about I- it. Yeah, I would argue that you couldn't actually shut down, especially with the the key share backups that we started doing. Uh, even if you somehow were able to, you know, call up AWS and you know do a coordinated shutdown of every single Thor node, uh, the network would be back up and running within a week. Even if you took down every single currently active validator with the current uh, method of backing up the TSS key shares to the chain. Uh, it's actually a very robust system where you'd be you'd be able to just spin up a new node from anywhere, import your mnemonic, and then just keep the network going, just resume right back from where we started. So e- even in the event of like a complete, uh, a complete like coordinated crackdown, uh, you, so you sh- somehow shut down every single Thor node at the exact same time, all the funds are still secure in that TSS vault, and it would just be a matter of uh, the node operators restoring their uh, their backups and. Uh, getting the show running again. I would argue. Yes, yeah, so, since I would well, argue that any concern you have about integrating Zcash is actually a concern just in general, you know, because the government could crack down on Thorchain at any moment because Thorchain is is running an, an exchange basically. So, um, what what steps are being taken? Like those, those steps should be taken now to do whatever is necessary to avoid that because that could happen tomorrow. Without Zcash. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, that really was exactly the community concern. It was just, it was, it was more around timing than around philosophy. You know, like I, I would say like the entire community was philosophically aligned. It was more so, and, and this was like a hotter debate at a certain time. I forget exactly when. Because it was right after um, the tornado cash sanctions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, 
Yeah, you know, it was more that it was just is Thor, is Thor team ready for that. And I mean, a lot of, I, I don't know the current stats on it, but there's definitely been a bigger push towards bare metal. Um, there's been like the backup that Cal was just talking about. So, um, yeah, you know, I think it's moving in the direction to be more resilient in general, such that it would be much more ready to to take on privacy. Yeah, we have, we have made advancements and become uh, more protected or more decentralized since the tornado cash, um, you know, event way back when. Obviously, there's more to go. I, th- I think last time I looked, I think we had like I want to say eight percent or so of our nodes are now, are now bare metal, or maybe ten percent now, or something like this. The bear market has actually pushed more nodes to become bare metal because it's much more cheap and efficient to run a, bear, a node a node as a bare metal than running it on AWS. But also that also means that the the number of nodes that are running on AWS or DigitalOcean or bare metal that any of these things could be shut down. You could you could literally kill all the AWS nodes right now. And it's not enough nodes that it would actually cause the network to even stop functioning. You could actually still, um, you know, churn and still be able to churn. Like even, but hypothetically, if the government was against, you know, and told AWS to shut us down, they would probably also tell DigitalOcean. We couldn't, we couldn't sustain both of those and, and, and not pause the network, but we would, but those people would be able to run those nodes could just rebuild those nodes on Petsner or bare metal or, I don't know, Google's, I don't know, any, any provider they want and with the same private keys and then carry on like nothing happened. Yeah, I think the whole thing with just integrating new chain, it's just become a, a like a very sticky governance debate in, in terms of like, you know, dev resources and, and stuff like that. So it's definitely not all charged by like, oh, we, we think the government's going to do this or that. It's just like, you know, we have, a, we have small, relatively small dev team and... Uh, well, other priorities like like lending and things like that and just haven't really done a lot of chain integrations uh as of late in the past like year or so well i remember that there is funding allocated from those three sources i i mentioned for zcash integration so maybe that could uh salt that could provide the dev, necessary dev resources there should be no greater priority than than decentralizing this network in my opinion for what it's worth yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, there's a lot of priorities in the COVID network. So we can talk about decentralization, which is obviously very important. And we, we are continuing to, to push on that. We can talk about adoption and integration. So that's a very important thing. We, we try to get integrated with more wallets and DEXs. We can talk about, um, you know, major new features, whether that be lending or order books or savers or something like this that is providing a, a valuable service that the community and the industry as a whole gets a, have access to it all today. Like those, all the things are very important things, and decentralization is definitely one of those one of those things on the list. You don't think decentralization is the number one most important thing that you guys could be doing right now? Um, I mean, I don't know how to quantify how how important one thing is over the other. To be honest with you, like to me, it's not it's not a comparative thing of like we either push on decentralization or we push on uh, integrations and, and that kind of thing. It's just more of like we we burn the candle at both ends. So we're constantly pushing for more volume more swaps, more decentralization, more this, more that. And I don't, I don't find them to be antithetical to each other. So I just, we just mm-hmm. push them all simultaneously. Hey, uh, allow me to say again, I, I think if you talk to a, a, an expert lawyer who's worked in this field and advised lots of other people in, in, in similar situations, you'd really get a ton of valuable and actionable information in a short time. So they're super expensive. Like, You'd probably spend thousands of dollars, I guess, but uh, that's not super expensive in the grander scheme of things. Um, and it wouldn't take very much of your time. I definitely strongly advise you, like, give it a shot and see what you get out of that. I can uh, recommend a bunch of really expert lawyers who know a lot about this stuff. Yeah, that actually would be great. Um, it actually would be fun, and not only to educate and inform myself and other kind of core devs and nine realms people, but also inform and educate the community at large. Maybe we can even do one of these Twitter spaces with, you know, one of the people that you recommend. Like I, that would be really fun and, and interesting and, and informative um, conversation to be had. Mm-hmm. Let me, I'm on, I'll, I'll uh, DM you later on Twitter and, and we'll, give me the, uh, the info and we'll, we'll, we'll sync up. I could save you a few cool. thousand dollars right now. Uh, do everything possible to get all the nodes off AWS and DigitalOcean, et cetera. Chad goes uh, anon, 
Chad, leave the project. Come back anonymous, please. Um, and uh, do stuff like that to remove all of these. Because a lawyer is just going to, I mean, I'd be worried that a lawyer is going to make it worse, depending on which lawyer you get. I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to decentralize the network or else you're done. Or you, or, you say, go, or you get captured. Why do you say that I have to leave and come back in on? What, what, is, how, what, what threat do I pose to the network? You, you're the lead developer of the, of the network. So, so what threat do I pose? You're a target, man. I mean, you are okay. the ThorChain target. But it has nothing to do with ThorChain, right? Like, what would, if I were to get arrested today, what would happen to ThorChain? Anything? I don't know. I don't know how many nodes you run. I don't know what kind of influence you have over over a lot of the parts of it, so I don't know. If, if I run nodes, and it has nothing to do with me being a developer, right? It's just being a node operator, in which case, it doesn't really matter if I'm a developer or not. It's that, That's a general statement against operators, I suppose. Look, man, <laughs> my point is, I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to what it would do to the network, but it would suck for you. And it would yeah, suck for, for development of the network because you're the lead dev. I tell you this though, it would definitely suck for me. But if I get arrested on the idea of writing code, that I would be in some ways be excited about, just because it gives me an opportunity to to establish that code is free speech. To be honest with you, like it'd be a terrible fight for me to have, but that's a fucking fight that I'd be willing to take because code is free speech. And anybody who wants to tell you, me that I can't write code is a fucking asshole. You'll be you'll be even better prepared for that fight if you talk to a lawyer. <laughs> I agree with you, man. I would actually love to talk to you, lawyer. I think it'd be great to have a conversation, and and we can invite this uh, gentleman onto this or woman, I should say, uh, to uh, the space or or maybe a Discord or or whatever. I'm actually so let me DM you later, just get some information. And Chris, okay. don't don't get me wrong. I appreciate your your input and in, in advice as well, Chris. I'm not, I'm not yeah, my you. general point. I didn't. Want, I don't want my general point to get lost, which was that, in my opinion. Um, the top priority for ThorChain should be to remove these points of centralization. Whether or not Chad being public is a point of centralization that should be addressed is up for debate, of course. But as far as nodes go, um, it, 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 it could come at any moment. It could come tomorrow. And so if that comes tomorrow, then what happens? The rest of the, of the work is out the window. That's my point. And so, um, you know, I think identifying those points of centralization, the nodes are the most obvious, but you know, identifying them are key and addressing them is immediate. This is the one, um, the most, the largest factor for me in, in trusting ThorChain as an ongoing uh, project. I think that the lack of priority, the lack of emphasis on this critical existential thing uh, is what holds me back from being a full-throated advocate of ThorChain. Yeah, kind of going off of what I was saying earlier about these key share backups. I'd like, let me just reiterate how important this is. So, like, it, it's um, we, we've talked a lot about like getting nodes off of cloud services and onto bare metal, and we haven't found there. There really isn't a way to say like definitively, oh, this this for the network to determine, hey. This uh, this node is running on bare metal, so let's increase their rewards or give them some kind of reward to give like as a as a carrot to say like, hey, uh, we need to incentivize bare metal because because you can't at the at the Thor node level. And I might be speaking a little bit over my head here, so Chad, please jump in if I'm saying something that's wrong. Uh, at the Thor node level, you wouldn't be able to say like, hey, this this client is being run on a bare metal server versus one that's at Amazon. There's just no way to uh, have there's no way to trustlessly say that you are like running on this type of hardware, or this, this, this other type of hardware. So by having something like this key share backup system, um, nodes can continue to run wherever they run current currently today. And even if a hundred percent of Thor, even if it became universal law that, you know, Thor chain nodes were illegal and you weren't allowed to run them, uh, and all of them were shut down at the very same exact instant, the, the network would be able to come online again extremely quickly, just on other providers, on bare metal, wh wherever anyone could spin up their Thor node again, because the people who are running Thor nodes obviously stake a lot of, of rune in order to do so and have a lot at stake. So they're very incentivized to re-spin up their nodes if they were to get shut down, obviously. Otherwise, they're just losing uh, their entire stake in the network. But... Um, 
it makes it so that way the, the network is actually capture resistant. So that way, if everything were to disappear tomorrow, the network would come back online just because everything is already backed up. Uh, and there's nothing really, there's nothing that's, that would be permanently lost just from, from nodes going offline for a couple hours or, or days or even weeks. That's cool. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the, the problems that we have, and, and I think this is something that Chris was, was pressing on a moment ago, is that like, is that how do we get people who run, run, run nodes today to move from um, providers like AWS and onto bare metal? And part of the issue is that we can't actually enforce it. We can't like hold a gun to people's heads and say, we have to do it this way. I, I don't know how a, a reasonable way for us to do that. And if we were to do that, you know, we would lose a lot in the bond. Like we actually become more centralized because maybe a lot of nodes would just walk away because they lack the technical skill to run bare metal. Because running bare metal is much more complex than running, you know, an AWS node. Uh, running actual physical hardware takes uh, some knowledge and understanding. Running your own firewalls, like all this stuff, is a skill set that you don't really require today if you're running on AWS, but it does if you're running bare metal. And so, like, the act of forcing everybody to become bare metal would cause less nodes to exist, which would cause them to be more centralized. And then also, you know, cause the inherent problems that come with that. And so it's a difficult problem, but I think part of the, the way to solve that, the only reasonable way that I can think to solve that, and of course, if you've got any ideas, let me know. I'd be happy to listen to them, is education, right? Is informing and educating, giving documentation to, um, to our node operators. They're like, hey, if you want to run them bare metal, but you're not really quite sure how to do it, Here's a, a good walkthrough guide to show you how to set up this this kind of thing, this firewall with this ports open like this, blah blah blah. These things to, to to kind of lower the the technical requirements in some sense or form. But if you have any other ideas on how to become more decentralized, Chris, I'm more than happy to listen. And, and, and if we if we can get if we can move forward in this regard, let's fucking move forward in this regard. I mean, we're, we all agree that decentralization is the key here, so we're probably, we want to move for as far down this road as possible. I'd be happy to help brainstorm. You know, if you want to do that, I know that you guys have been talking about this for like a year or two, right? So I'm sure there's plenty of great ideas that have been tossed around that I don't know about. So, yeah. but I'd be happy to chime in and, and have a chat for sure. Yeah, in terms of in infrastructure, like bare metal is, is probably the most important thing, and that's something that we're you know, um, to, we're we're doing much better on it. We had like almost no bare metal. I think we had like one or two bare metal like a year ago. And today, I think we have like 10 of them or something like this or nine or 10 or something like this. So we're definitely going in the right direction. It's actually economics that's pushing people towards bare metal because it's just uh, much more profitable to run a node on bare metal than it is on AWS. And so it's just like, especially in the downturn of the, of the, of the bear market, it's just naturally pushing people towards bears, bare metal in the bear market. But, um, yeah, if, if this way we can we can convince more people to run bare metal, that's probably the, the most uh, the, the biggest win we can make. I think it's a totally reasonable way to look at it, um, based on what you were saying before about how um, the network would centralize if, if people stopped running the um, AWS nodes, et cetera. But I I would actually look at it from the point of view of treat the network today as if all those all those node operators received a notice, you know, and were told to go offline like today. And what would the network look like then? It would be even worse probably because none of them would have had time to move to bare metal and they would have all just been forced offline one way or another, either technically forced or out of fear, which is more likely. Um, so I think that's a more prudent way to look at it from an adversarial point of view. And I think that in that case, it makes sense to really prioritize getting even if it's 10 20 percent of them getting them giving them the incentive they need to move to bare metal yeah um yeah it reminds me of like when china i think it was three of the provinces in china like two years ago had banned bitcoin mining and the hash rate of bitcoin mining just dropped uh, uh in half if you guys remember when this happened a couple of years ago just because China said no more Bitcoin mining in, in, in these three provinces. And eventually people just kind of like broke down their hardware, moved it to, you know, some, uh, some, some that came to the United States, some stayed to a neighboring country and rebuilt it. And today the hash rate of Bitcoin is actually higher today than it was, you know, two years ago. I think conceptually the same would occur here. It might cause a disruption to the network temporarily for people to rebuild their infrastructure, but it probably would not stop it. At least their nodes are, are highly incentivized to make it not stop it, and they lose millions of dollars. Can I 
Ask a question to Zuko. Um, yeah, shoot. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm just like it's going to be a very like generic question, but I'm quite curious on like roadmap of of Zcash and like what is what is next for Zcash. What are some things that you guys focused uh, about like as electric coin company? I know that recently. Um, the 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 amount of shielded Zcash has reached an all time high uh, in yeah. the network, which which is pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Are you noticing any like changing user behavior or like pretty much anything that that interests you? Um, yeah, I listen? I can answer briefly. There's a ton of things going on, and um, most of it is being done by organizations outside of the Electric Coin Company. Um, there's a couple other organizations that are working on extending Zcash to support arbitrary tokens like, you know, ERC-20 style things that can take advantage of all the Zcash L1 features, including the privacy. Um, there's people working on getting shielded support in hardware wallets like Ledger and Trezor. Uh, there's quite a few mobile apps under development by different parties. There's probably a bunch of things I'm forgetting. Over here at Electric Coin Company, the main thing we're focusing on right now is that the Zcash network has, you asked about if there's, you said that there's an all-time high in the amount of Zec shielded, true, and you asked if there's been differing user behavior. Yes, for almost a year now, there's been uh, somebody, some anonymous person or persons who occasionally show up and generate really large shielded transactions. So it could be that these transactions have like thousands of recipients, or it could be that they're sending thousands of change back to themselves or whatever. Nobody knows because it's all shielded. Um, and that has overloaded the network in various parts, especially the mobile wallets running on smartphones. About three out of five of the shielded mobile wallets are currently broken because they can't handle the load so at electric coin company what we're currently prioritizing is just optimizing the mobile wallets and the other parts of the network so it can handle the current load level does that answer your question uh, yeah, yeah absolutely that's 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 very interesting could you maybe expand a bit on just because i'm ignorant on that on that aspect um the the ledger uh shielded support uh, what is the yeah. problem there and yeah Trezor and Ledger have both supported, for context, Zcash has both transparent addresses and shielded addresses. Um, transparent addresses look just like Bitcoin, and they are perfect if you want that balance to be publicly transparent all the time uh, for some reason, like, uh, you know, it's that's somebody else's funds that are being custodied or it's a, a bridge where you want to have a live real time visibility into the status of those funds. So that's transparent addresses. And they're also transparent addresses are perfect for integrations such as with Thorchain because they work just like Bitcoin and you don't need privacy at that layer. People, the users get their privacy from having their, their funds stored in shielded addresses. And then the infrastructure like, CEXs and DEXs and everything else can use transparent addresses. So anyway, that's that's the architecture of the Zcash L1. And Trezor and Ledger have always, for many years, have supported storing your Zcash in your hardware wallet, but only if it's stored in a transparent address in the hardware wallet. So that's not ideal. That's where you do want shielded addresses to protect the users. And so both of them have said the two companies have said that they're doing work to implement shielded addresses in their hardware wallets, but it's been a long time and I can't tell how much progress they're making. Uh, but that's one of those things that is being done by other parts of the Zcash ecosystem that's outside of my knowledge or control. Wow, it's, it's, it's interesting. I didn't know that. So effectively, that means whatever the number, I think it was like 10% or something, 10% of, of Zcash is, is being shielded, like, uh, approximately, if I'm not mistaken. That means all those users, um, like, can't leverage uh, Ledger and Trezor. Absolutely. So, That's right. Yeah. All that shielded Zcash is not on a Ledger or a Trezor. It's in, uh, like, a full node, you know, running on a, on a 
laptop or desktop, or it's um, maybe in a paper wallet if you put it into a shielded address and then wrote down your private key, or it's on a mobile phone. Yeah, and it's a lot of Zcash. I, I would imagine a, a lot of people have told me that they, what they really want is to store their wealth shielded in a hardware wallet. So I would imagine that once one or both of those companies deliver, that there'll be a lot more Zcash moving into the shielded pool. Hey, Zuko, um, isn't there a Monero app for Ledger? Why is there not a Zcash shielded app for Ledger? I don't know. Yeah, I'll say if you're a Ledger it, customer, go open a support request for Ledger uh, at, on asking them for shielded Zcash support. Well, I think it was the Monero app was built by the Monero community. I think I'm just wondering if there's a technical reason that the Zcash shielded. I, I know there is a bunch more to it, which I don't a hundred percent. Because again, it's th- thank God it's a decentralized ecosystem, so I don't have to understand and influence a bunch of stuff. Um, So I'm not 100% sure I understand what's going on, but there have been a couple of funded projects to implement shielded um, uh, addresses inside Ledger. I know that it's a difficult technical problem because to use a shielded address requires generating a zero-knowledge proof, and generating a zero-knowledge proof is heavyweight in terms of memory usage, and hardware wallets have really constrained RAM levels. and I, I did hear just recently, like only a few weeks ago, that the Zcash Community Grants Program, uh, which is another thing that I have nothing to do with, um, gave a grant to a new developer who said he could implement uh, shielded addresses inside, I think, Ledger, one of those wallets, right away. So anyway, there is mo- there is forward motion on it. Yeah, we've had our own struggles with, uh, with Ledger and getting... Uh, like just, just regular ThorChain transactions supported. Uh, you still need to be on like developer mode to even use uh, to, to get a ThorChain address on your ledger. You can't do it from Ledger Live or anything like that. It's working with it. Even, even though like you know it's a decentralized ecosystem, they still have they still very much have full control of the of the stack of anything that goes into uh, into Ledger itself, and they're very yeah. protective of that. So like. Like, uh, just, yeah. you know, it, it, may, it might not even be like a like a physical constraint like that. It's just a function of just how their organization works. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, that reminds me that was part of the issue. So um, the Zcash Foundation, which is yet another independent, separate funded entity, um, funded someone to implement the Zcash shielded addresses inside Ledger, but they didn't include support in Ledger Live. Um, I guess Ledger Live is maintained only by the Ledger company. So in order for you know normal users to be able to actually use it, they need it to be integrated with Ledger Live or perhaps integrated with a different wallet that speaks to the Ledger firmware or whatever. Um, and they also require, uh, which I think is really cool, and I uh, applaud it, they require a security audit from their own security team from Ledger before they add anything to Ledger Live, if I understand correctly. Yeah, this is this is correct. I, I recall like we we had our own little like uh, fourteen app for for Ledger, and there was some sort of bug we wanted to fix. It was like it really, I think it was only like a four line change. It was very very small, but it took like I don't know six or nine months to get it approved. Like it was just ludicrously slow. Yeah, everything takes too long. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. Everything takes so much longer. Uh, the Monero days. app uh, is very difficult to use, and I think you even need to. I think you need to run a full node. Like, I think you need to use the the full node wallet to use it. Um, definitely not Ledger Live. Uh, so w- when I saw that originally, which it's, I think it's been out for a couple of years, I thought that basically anything could happen um, as long as Ledger is not like officially supporting it. But I guess maybe not, based on what you guys are saying, as far as Zcash goes. I'm unclear on that. Whether, like, to my, what I was interested in was users being able to use it, like, simply without without having to learn and put in a bunch of effort. So I don't know if it's possible to use it using that firmware that that company wrote previously. Um, 
but I do know that it's not possible to use it in Ledger Live in the normal way. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just how a lot of a lot of our organizations, like uh, they, like organizations that are not like in the upper echelon of uh, of the mind space, are not are not getting that that same treatment from uh, from Ledger. And that's just. It just seems to be just the, the status quo of things. Like they, they have control over their their own uh, their own software and their own hardware, so uh, you know they, they exercise it, and I, and it makes sense too because there's like they, they want to be able to review everything and from a security point of view, and uh, you know just deliver what they think is the best user experience. But that might not always align with what the, the community uh, in in general wants and needs. So um, Ledger has publicly said that they really want to add shielded Zcash and uh, on, on Twitter and everything. So I'm going to post the link so that uh, you guys can all fill up their mentions with polite feature requests. How's that? If you want. Let's yeah, do let's it. Do it. Let's, do let's do it. Let's so inundate Ledger with as much spam as we can to get them to move their asses. Okay, I posted a link. Uh, I think it would have shown up in this Twitter thread. Y'all see it? Unstoppable force meets unmovable object. <laughs> <laughs> cool, guys. Well... Uh, thank thank you guys so much for for coming on. Uh, this is a fun space, a long one too. But um, you, you guys are welcome on anytime. We do these on uh, on Fridays at at noon Eastern. So feel free to come hop in whenever. And you know, we just we just chat about Thorchain and whatever's going on in the space. So huge pleasure being able to talk with you guys uh, this week. And I don't think Zuko's ever been on. Chris Chris might have been on once a, a while ago, but. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Cheers. Keep up the good work on Thor King. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Yeah. Let's let's Thanks, wrap uh, and uh, let's definitely do it again. Next week. Cheers. Thanks, guys. And I'm happy to come back if Sounds you want to dive deeper into the decentralization stuff that uh, we were supposed to talk about before. Yeah, I'm I'm totally down. Yeah, I definitely that. want to make that happen. Yeah. Maybe next sorry week if you're around. So well today, but but I'm down, yeah, sorry about down that. I'll be on Wi-Fi next time. So, guys, peace.